to trust the Lord through the hard times, knowing that He is sovereign and faithful and in control. I praised the Lord for His faithfulness in leading him all the way home. Just having to trust the Lord that if He, if it, if he chooses to, to take me, that He'll take care of him. And that even though it's been my role to shepherd them, that if He takes me, He'll, he'll fulfill that. So I was in the eight blocks, having been sentenced to what amounted to a life sentence. It was only there a matter of weeks when um, a fellow prisoner arrived called Peter Thompson. Now, Peter and myself were on remand. I knew him well. But when Peter arrived in the eight blocks after having been sentenced, he was, uh, he was carrying one of these. He was carrying the Bible, and he was talking about Jesus which I thought was very convenient because he's just been given a life sentence. He wants to get out of prison early. How is he going to get out of prison early? We'll show the authorities that he's now a good guy. He's carrying a Bible instead of a bomb. But uh, as far as I was concerned, Peter was a hypocrite. He was a phony. Couldn't face up to the pressures of the penal system. He needed a crutch to lean on, and this is a really convenient crutch. Now, Peter, when he arrived in the H blocks, appointed himself the block barber. So if you needed a haircut, you had to send for Peter. And when Peter started to cut your hair, he had a really novel approach to evangelism. He used to get the scissors and he would put them into the side of your neck and he would be applying quite a bit of pressure like, and he would, and he would say, right, just another little, little bit of pressure and I'm into your juggler. And you're lying here in a pool of blood. And by the time they get a medic down here to stem the flow of blood, you're dead and you're in hell because you're not a Christian. Now, what about that for evangelism? And see if you're a good commie and you just wanted, you know, to get the hair cut. You were saying, Peter, would you, would you just give over and cut my hair like? But, you know, that was Peter's approach to, to evangelism. Now, you see around about 1978. This excerpt was taken from Billy McCurry's testimony. You can watch the full video on albianus.com entitled, From Terrorist to Evangelist, Billy McCurry's Testimony. He shared this recently at the Fellowship Conference UK. I, I grew up working with my dad on the farm, and we worked extremely hard. On the farm, you're always under time pressure. And there's weather brewing and always. And, but on Wednesday nights, we quit early. We parked the tractors. We parked the combine. We got cleaned up and we went to the prayer meeting. And even when it was inconvenient, even when you're planting or haying or harvest time, and, that is spiritual leadership in the home. It's that stuff, you know. That's what sticks with you. That meant more to me in my character. All the Bible stories my dad ever told me, he showed this is important. This is what we really do. This is what we sacrifice for. And maybe the hay gets rained on because we went to church. As for me and my house, we're, we're going to church. We're going to seek the Lord with his people. These statements in Scripture are intended for you and I to self-reflect. Not for us to look out and identify the Demases and the Josh Harrises of the world. But what about me? I've had to ask myself grappling with this text, what about you, Craig? Where am I at? Is my all on the altar? Does Christ have my whole heart? Am I truly trusting Him and Him alone? Or am I presuming upon God because of the past? Because of this blessing and that blessing? Because of experiences of the past? Because I know truth? Do I have pet sins that I excuse and justify? I must fight. I must fight in earnest. Charles Simeon, he was the minister, you know, in, in Cambridge, and I once preached at a, 
uh, a Christian Union choral service there, and I went in and I went to look for a certain portrait of a great missionary called Henry Martin, who died as a young man and took the gospel to the Arab world, and I saw it there. And Charles Simeon said, every time I look into his face, he says to me, don't trifle. Don't trifle. There's a war on. It's far more bloody than the war in the Ukraine. It's far more merciless. It's a war for the souls of men and women. Romans 1.15, you drop down a little bit. Next thing Paul says here, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. The gospel's got to be preached. That's another thing he says here. Nobody believes in a Christ that they have not heard in. And I just ask you this, who's going to tell them? I mean, think with me. The only message that truly offers men and women hope. It doesn't matter what you are, Greek, barbarian, wise, you're foolish, you're Jew, you're Gentile, you're British, you're Chinese. You know what? There is simply no other hope. Do you re recognize eternal hell, eternal fire, eternal torment? What's the only hope of escape? Faith in Christ. We've got that message. There's no other hope. And brethren, we can't just sit at home or in our, you know, on our rear ends or hide away in our little church building. We've got to get out there in the midst of this people and proclaim the gospel of God, which concerns this eternal Son of God. And the thing is, brethren, we know there's all sorts of different messages out there. You got people that claim to be Christian, but they're preaching something else. And you got a lot of people that don't even claim to be Christians, and they've got all sorts of manner in which they're wanting to give hope to men. There's always, look, all advertising. Every, everybody's coming along and saying, eat that food and buy that car and do this thing, go on holiday over here, and you'll, do, you'll be satisfied. You'll be happy then. People, that, that's, that's all around us. We're being flooded by this. We live in a world. There's just many, many ways to to safety, many ways to pleasure, many ways to satisfaction. We have people preaching many ways to God. There's no lack of that. There's no lack of people out there that have some sort of good news, supposedly. No shortage of ideas, no shortage of theories. It's just, it's, listen, that's exactly the kind of social setting that we all live in. We recognize that. Oh, brethren. We have, a, we have that one message that deals with men and women, right? Where their greatest need is. I mean, look, the, the greatest realities in the world, what are they? They are God. They are death, life, Christ, the cross, hell, eternity, judgment day, faith, sin. I mean, these, these things have to do with every one of us. And there aren't a lot of ways to deal with sins. There aren't numerous ways to God. I mean, Jesus is not one among many gods. That's a, there's salvation in no one else. Isn't that what Scripture tells us? There's no, no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. There is one way, and there's only one way. And we've got to proclaim it. We've got to preach it. And look, it's the only way that people are going to come to a place of salvation. Brethren, there ought not to be silence from our lips. So I was talking to a member of my family this week and how were things in the church? And he said, oh, we had a couple. They came to us from Australia and, you know, they were unhappy with the church. When they came to us, they seemed to be very happy and they were with us and in all the meetings. And then suddenly they stopped. They disappeared. And um, when I finally saw him, he'd been reading the web. He'd been reading the anti-Christian, atheistic websites, many of them, and articles, many of them, deploring the Christian faith. And they got him. And you know the consequences. You can guess the consequence. 
a man who leaves the faith, it's not long before he leaves his wife. Before there's moral collapse and divorce, the faith holds us, it grips us. What value there is. We are living lives informed by them, leaning upon them. And so the apostle at the end, he is saying to us, you know, I've not lost my faith in this personal risen Savior. I've not lost my commitment to him. Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love for him is weak and faint, yet I do love him. And I'm looking forward to loving him more and more. That faith begins in the, in the intellect, but then, oh, my friends, that faith goes through every nook and cranny of our lives, it teaches, uh, reaches our affections. It's in the mind, then it's in the emotions. And it determines our choices, our fidelities. How important are our marriage vows? Our options, and the whole tone of our lives. Whenever Paul rejoiced, it was his faith that made him rejoice. Whenever he wept, it was his faith that made him weep. And when he made decisions, he made them because he was a believer and disciple of Jesus Christ. And he set before him certain options, certain priorities, certain preferences that would always be in first place in his life. They determined what he was to believe. For him to live was Jesus Christ. And you go further, he had rest, didn't he? He had peace. He came to Christ and he was given rest. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He knew it. He knew that just could live and go on living day by day by faith. In his heart, there was peace with God. And his doctrine made him work. It never allowed him to stop working in the work of faith. I've kept the faith. I have the peace of my faith. I have the work of my faith. In other words, in other, in other words his theology wasn't something that he analyzed that he liked debating about with other men. It wasn't something simply that he meditated upon and sang in hymns, but it was something to proclaim. It was something to share. It was something he owed to everyone he met. And if the conversation by the providence of God and his own wisdom began to move in a certain way, he went with it, that he could say to that person, yeah, I yeah, I, I've had uh, such a, a good time in my life since I became a Christian. Oh, oh, what was that then? And so he kept on, his faith kept him working. So I've kept the doctrine and I've kept my commitment and my trust and I've kept my pledge. I've kept faith with God. I've been faithful to my God. In other words, when he saw and was struck blind on the Damascus Road and heard Jesus speak to him, there was a commitment. In that intellectual revolution that took place then, it resulted in a pledge that he made. What wilt thou have me do, O Lord? I, the disciple, you the master. So I want to talk to you about the most important thing in all of existence. This news that I want to tell you is the most important news you will ever hear in your entire life. The issue is this, that man and God are at odds with one another. You, sir, ma'am, friend, 
there's a conflict, there's a war, there's a battle, and you are an opposing side to the Lord Almighty. You may say, how did I get here? This is news I haven't heard before. I, I don't doubt you may not have heard that, but that doesn't in any way take away from the reality that it is true. See, the, the, the situation is this, that God is holy, holy, holy. He's true. He's almighty. He's perfect. He's good. He is awesome. And no one, no, 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 no one questions this. The Bible is, is filled with examples of scriptures that talk about His majesty. And I think of Isaiah 6, 1, that, that, that talks about the holiness of our God. He is, he is amazing. Now, while this is all true and we say amen to this, there is another truth, and that is that you are not. You, God is good, God is mighty, He is perfect, but you are not. You are not good, you are not perfect. In fact, far from being perfect, you are sinful. In Psalm 51, we are told that we are shapen in iniquity and sin that our mothers conceive us. We are born sinful. This is a problem. See, when Adam sinned, when Adam rebelled against God, all of creation was put underneath the dark cloud of God's curse. Judgment has fallen on all of humanity, and we are now born with the heart that is set upon doing evil. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone our own way. See, there is a God who sits upon a throne. He is king. And yet we have rebelled against his reign. We have rebelled against his authority. We have gone not as just neglecting him, but as willfully and violently opposing him because we have loved our sin. We have chosen our sin. We have chosen the things that God hates. And this creates a problem. In fact, you can say that it creates two problems for the reality is that God only accepts perfection. Jesus, he said, you therefore must be perfect as my Father is perfect. Perfection is the standard. It will not be lowered for you or for me or for anyone else. Perfection is the standard. Only perfect people get to heaven. The problem is, as I've already alluded to, that we are not perfect. We have broken the laws of God. We have not believed Him. We have not loved Him. We have not served Him. We have not honored Him. We have not worshipped Him as He is worthy to be worshipped. This is the first problem. But it gets worse. It doesn't just stop that we have disobeyed him. See, every sin has a consequence. The wages of sin is death. There's a punishment. And that is the very anger and fury and wrath of God. So not only have we disobeyed God, but that disobedience has resulted in a consequence. And that consequence is the wrath of God and it is approaching. The people who are watching this, there may be many differences from you and me, but here's something that is true. It is appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. The reality is this, is that you, sir, you ma'am, will face death. Death is coming and death, when it comes for you, the Bible talks about it coming suddenly. Life is a vapor, is a mist. It's here and then it's gone. You don't know when it is coming, but it is coming for you. And when it comes for you, that consequence that your sins have earned you will fall upon you. See, eternity is forever. The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. These are the two problems that all of humanity faces. You face this. You have disobeyed God and because you've disobeyed Him there is a wrath that is coming for you and death is the gateway to get you there and you don't know when you're gonna die. And you can see why this would be a problem. This is bad news. But our God who is so holy, so mighty, so kind, though we are in the position that makes us helpless. See, you can't earn perfection after you've broken the law of God. You cannot cry and plead and ask for forgiveness in any way that would remove the wrath of God. That doesn't do it. Your works are not going to remove the wrath of God. Your efforts are not going to do it. Your tears are not going to do it. Your church attendance, dressing up, dressing down, at good works, uh, volunteering, charity, none of those things are going to satisfy the wrath of God and none of those things are going to allow you to be perfect. 
It's not going to meet the requirement. So what does? Well, this is the good news that I want to bring to you, why it's so important. See, the Father sent His Son. The good news is that Jesus Christ came into this world, born of a virgin, perfect, sinless, spotless, the spotless Lamb of God. And He came to do what? To obey where we have disobeyed. He came to fulfill the law of God. He satisfied the righteous requirement of the law. And why is this good news? Because, like I said, only perfection gets you into heaven. And none of us are perfect, but Jesus Christ came and He lived perfectly. And not just that, oh, after he satisfied the law, after he was obedient to the point of death, he surrendered his life to the cross. He surrendered his life to be a sacrifice. See, like I said, one problem, none of us are perfect. We have all sinned. But problem two, that we deserve a punishment. We deserve a consequence. And that consequence is not just death, but it is eternal death. Well, Jesus Christ upon the cross, he surrendered himself to take upon himself the due penalty that we all deserve, the wrath of God. It was laid upon him. On the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, on the cross, Jesus Christ was paying our debt, his blood which is a picture of his life, was satisfying the righteous requirement. It was satisfying the wrath. It was satisfying what we need to be forgiven. It was satisfying all that is needed in order for us to be accepted by God. And he dies. He really dies. For he's both God and man. He really lays down his life and he's put into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea as it was prophesied. Three days later, he comes back to life with a promise. See, he has conquered death. He has conquered the enemy, Satan. He has conquered sin. And he comes back with a promise that everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. See, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did in his perfect life and what he did in his sacrificial death and what he did in his victorious resurrection, you, no matter what you've done, no matter how many sins you've committed, no matter how many times you've done it, no matter what the blasphemy, no matter what the shame, you, sir, you, ma'am, will be saved. Saved from what? Saved not only from hell and the wrath of God, but saved from the power of sin that has you a slave. See, the Bible talks about sin being a slave master and you being a slave of sin. And you're chained to those masters, chained to those sins. And no matter how much you look at freedom and say, I want freedom from pornography, I want freedom from adultery, I want freedom from lying, freedom from pride, freedom from anger, freedom from idolatry, freedom from whatever sin has you bound, you may say, yes, I want freedom. And you may experience a little bit of relief for a week or two. But what do you know? You know like I know. You find yourself slaved and chained to that master once again back to the old things. Why? Because you're a slave and you can't free yourself. But what Jesus Christ did on the cross is he smashed those chains. He tore apart the bars. He opened the gates wide so that we could be free to obey him and to want to. He gives us a new heart, new affections, new desires. He changes you supernaturally. The Holy Spirit comes. He lives within you. He gives you a new heart, new affections, new desires. And you walk victoriously, forgiven of all of your sin, empowered to live righteously and promised that you will be with Christ forever in heaven. This is the good news. This is the news we want to bring to you. This is the news that can save you, that can finally set you free from all the things that you've tried all your life to be free from. Here is the news, the message of Christ and Him crucified. God has always brought revivals to souls, to churches, to nations, to missionary work. The first Great Awakening, 1730s through 1780s, Britain was gone morally, horrendously worse, really, than even what we see now in America. God raised up George Whitfield and the Wesleys, Jonathan Edwards in, in New England, and just through the preaching and praying of God's people, God sent rivers from heaven and turned the tide. And the gospel swept the British Isles. George Whitfield preached in Boston 
when the population was 12,000 and Benjamin Franklin estimated there were 14,000 people there that day that came from everywhere. It was like a prairie fire. Fast forward, 1857-58, the Fulton Street Prayer Revival. How many of you know about that? Fulton Street, Manhattan, right near Ground Zero Memorial, right there. The North Dutch Reformed Church, Fulton Street. A young evangelist, city missionary they called him, Jeremiah Lamphere, had a burden. He said, you know, I think it's a good idea maybe to start a prayer meeting for businessmen. He did. He put up flowers about it. And first day, he was there and nobody else. And then suddenly, two came in, three came in, five came in. And within months, around New York City, there were 50,000 people gathering at noon in prayer meetings. They couldn't find buildings big enough to hold them. And that prayer revival, hundreds began to be converted. And within a year, there were 50,000 re recorded conversions and people joined the evangelical churches in the day when you didn't walk the aisle, sign a card, and you're a member. No, you were examined to see if your profession was credible. 50,000 filled the churches of New York City in the greater area. And that prayer revival spread west like a prairie fire. All around the south to South Texas, all the way to California, God ignited a huge season of revival in prayer. Fast forward quickly, 1949, 52, Hebrides Islands of Scotland, Duncan Campbell was an evangelist. He was preaching in England, but there were two little praying ladies in Scotland, in the Hebrides, Peggy and Sue. Catherine. Thank you, historian. Peggy and Catherine. Peggy and Sue, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a Western song, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, two little women whose ministry was intercession in their house. They had never been married. Hey guys if, and ladies, if you don't ever get married, God doesn't do that, give yourself to a ministry of intercession. It's the biggest need. A lot of young guys want to preach and teach, how many of them want to give themselves to a life of prayer? So these ladies started praying. They had a burden. And they, they called their minister to come by. And they said, we believe God wants to bring Duncan Campbell here. Would you send him a telegram or whatever? Well, he respected these ladies, so he did. Campbell replied, I couldn't come for two years. I'm just booked. So the minister comes back and tells the ladies, and to which one of them said, that's what Duncan Campbell says, but God says he's coming. <laughs> he's preaching on a platform in a, in a conference in England. He's supposed to bring the closing message, and he's overwhelmed with his burden that he needed to leave and go to Scotland. He does. He leaves, ultimately gets on a boat to go to the Hebrides Islands. He arrives. I don't know, two days, three days later. He gets off the boat, and there's a man standing there who says, Are you Mr. Campbell? Are you walking with God? Well, there's a meeting in the church tonight you're going to preach at. He said, How did you know I was coming? He said, How did you know to come? God was at work. And the Spirit of God swept those Hebrides Islands. Many, many conversions. I don't have time to tell that story. Fast forward, 1971, Western Canada. Bill McLeod. They were having a crusade, two weeks of meetings. The Spirit of God fell. And hundreds were converted. They couldn't find buildings big enough for the crowds that began to come. And it swept Western Canada and parts of the northern states, northwestern states in America. God has always brought revivals. And when the Holy Spirit comes, 
He comes suddenly, surprisingly, mysteriously, sometimes like a gentle breeze, sometimes like a gushing wind. It's like a snowball rolling down a snow-covered hill. It's growing. It's like a gentle light rain increasing and more keeps coming until a downpour soaks everything. The wind, the wind was blowing. That's how you explain Pentecost. The wind was blowing. Acts 4, they pray, the house is shaken, and they're all filled with the Spirit of God. The wind was blowing. We need, brothers and sisters, for the wind to blow. Your church needs it. Our church needs it. For more than 50 years, Christians around the world have profited from listening to the preaching of the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Born in the last month of the 19th century, he was a Welsh medical doctor converted to Christ in the midst of his medical pursuits, eventually laying aside a prestigious medical career for the Christian ministry. Dr. Lloyd-Jones is widely regarded as the greatest preacher of the 20th century, and probably the most prominent reason for this is the way that God's anointing rested upon him, enabling him to so preach and teach the Word of God that listeners were regularly brought into a real encounter with God through His Word. The one thing He tells you to be concerned about is this, is your own soul, your relationship to God. And it's something which is intensely personal. You see, he talks about entering into a straight gate. And I always think that this straight gate is not like we used to have it on the pictures that the old people used to hang on their walls. I think this straight gate was a turnstile. And you know the point about a turnstile, don't you? It only admits one person at a time. You can't go two of you together into a turnstile. Husband and wife can't go together. Father and mother can't go together. Parents and children into the turnstile, one by one. That's the straight gate. You and God. We have, have the privilege of having our brother Pat Horner and his wife Diane with us. Uh, in fact, it's her birthday today. Happy birthday, sister. <laughs> um, yeah, Pat and I go way back. Uh, I think it was probably about 29 years around this time right now I first talked to Pat on the telephone. Tim was down here at that time. We were communicating. He was all excited about what God was doing down here and, and the burden for the, uh, in the church for missions and evangelism and uh, God saving people. I was very much in, in the, the dead cold north <laughs> desiring such things. And So I, I had talked to Pat on the phone and they, they started sending me uh, cassettes. Anybody here know what those are? <laughs> yeah. Started sending me cassettes of the messages on Sunday, and so we were listening to those, being fed by that. Started praying whether it was God's will to move down here, and and uh, and we did. And certainly believe to this day it was God's will, and hasn't been without trials and difficulties, but it's been a great, tremendous blessing. And I remember when we first came down, Pat was just starting uh, the book of Acts. And no doubt, um, I mean, there's some very tangible things I, I can bring, you know, come to mind in ways that Pat has shaped and influenced myself. Um, I think John and Tim as well, no doubt. But I'm sure there's ways he has that I'm not even aware of. And so I, I really have a debt of gratitude to you, brother. Very thankful for 
God using you in my life. And, uh, and so I've asked Pat to come, and uh, providentially, we, you know, we had another, we had something scheduled this, I was planning on doing it in November, and providentially the schedule opened up, so I, I asked him, and he was more than willing to come, and excited about it. So I asked him this first hour to share his testimony and whatever, whatever else God would lay in his heart in terms of, you know, starting the work there in, in Elmendorf and how, he, how the Lord's led him to the uh, ministry in India and, and the work there. And, and so, brother, why don't you come forward and, and, and he'll be preaching for us in the next hour. We're, now, we are going to have a baptism, but kind of like that one week, we kind of floated the Lord's table because we weren't ready. Well, I don't know when we're going to have the baptism, but this depends on David's trucking and he's traveling right now, so it may be in between services. It might be after, so I think we can we'll deal with that when it becomes clear. In case you all haven't noticed, I'm tall. It is a joy to be here with you this morning. Uh, Craig, as he said, asked me to share uh, my testimony with you, and so we'll be doing that in the first hour and then preaching, God willing, um, in the second hour. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Psalm 32. As Craig said, we go back a few years, <clears throat> and um, the Lord has been good. The Christian walk is not one that is a pathway that is straight. It is full of crooked ways and valleys and mountain tops in the, in the middle of the way, and it is full of enemies and, and full of trials. Uh, but it is always attended uh, with God being with you in the midst of it. And so our paths uh, joined and then we moved in different directions. He had his ministry, I had mine. Uh, Lord using him according to his, God's purposes for his life. And God using me according to God's purposes for my life. And now our paths have crossed briefly uh, here this morning. In Psalm 32, David opens up this psalm with a declaration of and a testimony concerning God's work in saving him. We do not know when God did that. We just know that he did. The scripture opens up with the word blessed here. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And I'll stop reading there. God imputed David's iniquity to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God imputed the righteousness of the Son of God to David, and David knew that he was blessed when God did that. And if you're here this morning and you were saved this morning, that is exactly what God has done on your behalf through His Son, Jesus Christ. I was born in what is commonly called today a dysfunctional family. I didn't know that word or I didn't know that situation while I was growing up. My father was a drunkard. He didn't work and support our family. My mother did that. I was the oldest of eight. When any of the kids were sick, I stayed home and took care of them. Because she had to go to work. And that was the life that I grew up in. We were Roman Catholics. 
and uh, not very good ones, but we were in name Roman Catholics. My wife, who I met when we were 14, was also Roman Catholic. And uh, she had been to Roman Catholic schools. Um, we, as I said, met when I was, when we were 14, went to school together, uh, were friends together, worked on the school newspaper together, those kind of things. And then the last three months of high school, I asked her out. Um, and um, that was in April, and we were married in July. And, uh, but you say, wow, that's quick. Well, it was quick, but not so much. We'd been friends since we were 14, so. And uh, uh, we promptly spent the next five years uh, trying to build a marriage and actually working on destroying it. And then God saved me. And uh, in the summer of... 1975, when I was 24 years old, uh, the Lord saved me. I was under conviction of sin for some time and didn't know what that was. Um, didn't know the theology. I didn't know anything. I was raised in a home. There was no Bible. When it, At the age of 12, I went looking for a Bible in our house, and there was none. Uh, at the age of 17, I went looking for a Bible in our house. There, there was no Bible in my home. Uh, but uh, Diane's grandmother had given her a Bible, and it was a nice little Bible put with a, in a nice little box, and she carried it with her when we got married, and we put it in a drawer. And at the age of 24, I went searching for a Bible again and found it. And what do I know about the Bible? I don't know anything about the Bible. Open up the first page, and in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I just started reading. Well, uh, for all those of you that have read the Old Testament as a Christian, you know that's a difficult task. And uh, as a lost man, it's even more difficult. But I just kept reading. My wife was working and six weeks at home without a job, under conviction of sin, crying myself to sleep at night because I knew that if I died, I was going to hell, and I had no idea how to get out of that situation. And I stumbled through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And by the time I got to the Gospel of John, I began to see that Jesus Christ would say to sinners, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And I thought, wow, if he could do that for them, maybe he could do that for me. And so I would seek the Lord's face for that very thing. Lord, forgive me. Lord, have mercy upon my soul. And... I wasn't under the instruction of a pastor. We didn't have any other Christian literature in the house. Just kept reading the scriptures. I had a sense of peace. I stopped crying. I had a sense that everything was going to be okay. I didn't know what that was. I had a sense that I could not go back to what I used to be. I didn't know what that meant. And I was explaining that to my uncle, and he said, it sounds like God has saved you. And I said, what is that? And Because uh, I hadn't come across that word yet. And uh, he said, well, come to church on Sunday. And the preacher preached. And I said, that's what God did for me. That's what God did for me. He saved me. And then I was uh, baptized in November and preached my first message in the San Antonio Rescue Mission in December. Preached six and a half years at the San Antonio Rescue Mission every Saturday uh, for six and a half years. God gave me an immediate burden for lost. I thought if God could save me, he could save anybody. And uh, still believe that, by the way. Still believe that. God, my wife thought she was saved and we started attending a, a services, but three years later, she came under uh, conviction of some sin and, uh, and received Christ as her Lord and as her Savior. We, we went to church together. We, you know, things changed in our, in our uh, household. Um, I was committed to her, and I was committed to making our marriage work. And I was committed that uh, she would never again have to ever, ever worry that her husband would ever forsake her again. 
And so the Lord started putting our marriage together, and the Lord started opening up doors for me to do some teaching. And it wasn't long before I was uh, uh, teaching a Bible study uh, in our church, uh, and it, it grew. And people were saying, well, you ought to think about the ministry. And I, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm going to work, I'm going to give money to, mis- to the church and to missions, and, and I'm very content just doing what I'm doing. And then after a while, I... Uh, I began to think, well, maybe so. And more and more people were saying, Brother Pat, you need to think about the ministry. It looks like God is using you. And uh, I didn't want that. I didn't pursue that. And finally, I counseled with uh, my pastor at the time. And he said, I've just been waiting for the day when you would come into my office because I've been watching this for some time. And... Uh, and he agreed to ordain me. And in May of 1979, uh, just shy of four years after God had saved me, five years, after, uh, four years after God had saved me, we went out. I went out and started the first church. And uh, I've never done anything except start churches. Uh, I recently, uh, start churches and go to the mission field. I, most of my ministry is we start from scratch. We start with nothing, and we. And we see what the Lord will do uh, in this place. And a uh, few years after that church was started, we merged with a church on the north side of San Antonio. That church, uh, uh, that merger uh, settled down after about a year. The church uh, was in good shape. And I left that church. And in the July of 1983, last Sunday of July of 1983, we went to Elmendorf and started uh, Community Baptist Church. By the way, that... They're celebrating their 39th anniversary today uh, over there. And, uh, and, and praise the Lord. And, that was, and we started with three families. One of them left. We had four adults and a handful of children. And that's where we got started. But God had plans. God never starts something he doesn't finish. And God had plans. And I immediately began to think that it was possible that God could use a local church at that time stuck out between two cornfields in the middle of Elmendorf to have some sort of an impact in the world. I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that from reading the scripture that God uses his churches. And I thought, well, if God uses his churches, he can use this one. And so we began to pray. And uh, a year or so later, I met a a man in a coffee shop and he was moving down here uh, from Alaska and he was asking about the church and I was explaining what I felt like was the burden of the church and burden of my heart and I said you know who knows someday we may be able to minister in India. It was just a off-the-cuff statement it was not because it was in my heart it was just one of those things you say who knows you know and and you make a statement and you go on with the conversation and he interrupted me and said I know somebody in India. I said, well, give me his name and address, and I'll write him. And uh, that began a four-year uh, uh, friendship of writing back and forth. We didn't have internet or email or <laughs> what do they call it? Instagram. Somebody told me, somebody did something on Instagram, and I thought, I've heard about that, but I, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because you know, I don't know what that is. And um, um, I'm getting slowly into the 21st century. Y'all bear with me. Handwritten letters. Take six or seven weeks to get there, six and seven weeks back. Uh, Four years of communicating, sending books, building a library. And then in the middle of that, we raised enough money to bring him over. And then in 1990... Uh, the Lord opened the door. The Indian government gave me a five-day pa- visa to go into a restricted area that had been restricted for 34 years. And I had five days to preach. The Lord blessed. And uh, in a number of ways. And when I came home with a burden for Northeast India, and, but I knew it was going to be difficult because it was a very, very difficult field. And uh, they had armed guards around me. They didn't, 
uh, where we were at was not a good place, safe. Anyway, but nonetheless, God opened a, a door to keep communicating. We went back to 1992, then Civil War broke out again. And there, the door was closed, and that was it. I couldn't get back in. I brought James out in 96 when things were a little bit better, and the Indian government was not offering visas. And uh, so finally in 2003, um, John and Tim and I went to Northeast India. And again, and, um, and then began the communication as to how to get back in. And finally we were counseled, I was counseled that we should go into a different state that it was safer there. It was the safest state in all of Northeast India and we could live there and we could live peaceably there. And so we did. In 2005 we went to Northeast India and settled in for our 10-year ministry. Before that though, before that 19... and as we were writing letters back and forth, I, my burden for missions began to increase and I began to pray for open doors. And we had some major problems in the church in 88 and, and God brought us through and in 89 we had um, an unusual meeting with the Lord. The Lord met with us in an unusual way in a meeting and it changed the whole character of the church and the first we sent a family out and started our first church in December of 89 and then again in 90 and uh, this church came out of Community Baptist Church. I wasn't there at the time but uh, the Lord opened the door for us to begin a work in Mexico and the uh, spring of 90 we began communicating with somebody in Mexico and in the summer of 90 I went to India and in the fall of 90 I went to Mexico. Things just began to happen and um, we began to see God use a small little church, smaller than this one, to have an impact in people's lives on other, in other places. And that's the Lord. That's the Lord. It's not how much money you have. It's not how many people you have. It's not the size or the beauty of your building. It's not that. It's not how much education you have, though I am adamant that a man standing in the pulpit should be educated in, that is, by God. But it's not that. You see, it's the Lord. If it pleases the Lord, then doors open. If it pleases the Lord, and God moves in the preaching. If it pleases the Lord, then churches are brought into existence. If it pleases the Lord, pastors are raised up. If it pleases the Lord. You see, we're, we're dependent. We're com dependent upon God to do for us what only God can do. We cannot do this thing. We don't have a handle on this thing called Christianity. I, I hope you know that. And if it were not for the Lord, we would not be here today. Grace is effectual. We believe that. It works in us. God works in us, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And so God was working. God was working in a church. And I was, I was glad to be part of that. I was thankful to be part of what God was doing. And um, as God opened doors, the Scriptures would teach us and uh, that as God opens doors he also allows many adversaries and uh, there were many conflicts but in the midst of all of that God teaches his children how to persevere and shows them that their enemies though greater than they are are not greater than he is and they fall to the right side and to the left as God makes a way for his people to do what God would have them to do. And so, in 2005, we went over. John and 
Judy and Diane and I went over to Northeast India. We settled in a city called Guwahati, and we settled in the st it was in the state of Assam. It was relatively quiet uh, in at that time. It is no longer, but it was relatively quiet at that time. And we were able to go into areas that were difficult. And as the ministry expanded, John's burden moved him in a different way, and my burden moved me in a different way. But that, that's all right. That's not a problem. That's not a negative thing. It's God moving his servants where God would have them uh, and using them as God would use them. And uh, a door opened up for me in the state of Tripra to go and preach. John didn't have a burden for that. He wanted to go into Upper Assam. So he went that way and I went this way. And that's the way the Lord does that. He uses his servants in different ways. And the Lord brought a good amount of fruit in the state of Tripra. 1978 in Tripra, the Baptist Union had changed the gospel from repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ to we will baptize you if you want to become a Christian we'll put you in one of our churches and you will perhaps come to know who Jesus Christ is and so from 1978 until 2006 when I arrived the Baptist churches in the state of Tripra had been filled up with baptized people who thought they wanted to become a Christian but they were not converted the problem over there is that people are very poor and, and uh, I'm going to use these two right here as examples and, and this one is a Christian and now he's, a, he's prospering a little bit and this one is an animist and uh, he's worshipping his uh, forefathers and he sees this one prospering and he goes to a Baptist leader and says uh, I see him prospering and I'd like to prosper like that and the Baptist leader says well you have to be a Christian to do that. Well, the world knows, I mean, I hope you know, the world is, has put together a lot of rich people who are lost and die in their riches and go to hell. But you have to be a Christian to do that. Okay, well, what do I have to do to become a Christian? Well, you need to be baptized. We'll put you in one of our churches. And so, boom, he, because he wants to be prosperous like this one, he, he said, okay, I'll, that's what I'll do. And that's the situation over there. And that's what we found in the state of Tripura. And so we gathered people together and started preaching that men are sinners in need of a Savior and that they need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be called a Christian. And God began to save some people. And the churches were a mess. They were set up like Rome sets up their churches and they were not set up like Baptist churches, <laughs> Baptistic churches. And, and so we began to preach on the doctrine of the local church and different things and God began to bring some people together and we established some churches and there's ten churches there still functioning today and um, the Baptists got upset with us and joined hands with the Hindus and told them that I was supporting the insurgents and that I was forcing conversions it's against the law in India to do both those the first one means a long time in jail <laughs> We were, doing, were not doing either one of them, and we were investigated by the equivalent of their FBI. And during that time, that was 2008 and 2009, in Tripura, that was what was going on, and we couldn't go back until that was settled. And then in Assam, the RSS, a radical arm of the Hindu, had targeted my wife and I to kill us. We could barely leave our house without escorts. And then the insurgents were coming up and the bombs went off in Guwahati in 1990 and Al-Qaeda. And things began to crumble. And in 2012, John was not allowed back in. And we were kept coming back and forth. We'd leave and come back, leave and come back. And, we, and during 2008 and 9, I'd leave Diane at home and go back. They'd pick me up at the airport. I'd go stay in the upper room in somebody's house, gather some men there, preach, and send them back to the churches and the villages, and then I'd be escorted back to the airport and fly back out. And that was our ministry. And then John couldn't go back in, and then I thought, well, that's the end of it. But God left the door open for us in 2012, 13, and 14, and 15. We were able to go back and forth. And the Hindus forced us out of the house we were living in, 
in one place and we had to move again. It's common over there. You live in a Hindu area and a Hindu wants the house you're living in, they just threaten the landlord. And you're packed up and finding another place to live. And so we had to move. And finally we decided we're going to buy a piece of land and we just bought a piece of land. They're not going to be able to drive us off of this and found out they can do that. It is a strange place to minister to. <laughs> when the new government came in in 2014, they changed the laws eventually and we had to change the way we own land over there. It's a difficult place to minister. But in 2015, the Indian government decided that they didn't want my wife and I in anymore and so they wouldn't renew our visa and so it has been a very very uh, difficult time since then uh, for us both because that's where our heart was and we actually both thought we would die there uh, ministering among those people but we've stayed in touch thank God for technology that I didn't have in 1980s and uh, we can now have face-to-face -face communication, working on a situation if God would allow it, to have um, a thing called Zoom. Some of you already know what that means. I just learned what that means so I can do some teaching um, and, um, some, and try, working on a situation, see if we can get that settled. And there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, and God continues to work. Right now, though, we are in a place where we haven't been in a, in a very, very long time. We are without a church and we are without a ministry except what doors the Lord is opening for us. And we are praying. And so uh, I want to end this part of my time with you this morning asking you to please pray for us. And God would open the door and let us know what it is that is the next thing on His list for me and for my wife as we serve the Lord together. Uh, we do not know what that is. He does. But we don't. And so if you would, please pray for us. Okay? And I want to thank Craig and the, and the other elders here, and I want to thank the church here for uh, the privilege uh, of being here with you this morning. And I I have no idea what time it is, Craig. Uh, so, and so uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to stop or if I could take some liberty, turn that thing off. <laughs> Somebody watch the time, all right? And open it up for any questions. Ah. <laughs> you up to that, Brother Pat? I'm up to it. If God is put anything in your heart. Any questions from anyone? Yes, sir. Did not have a Bible in our home. Right. I started in the Old Testament. All the way through. Until you got to the book of John. Right. Kept going after that until I got to the God. That's where God stopped me. And then the Lord opened your eyes. Right. And since that time until this, every time I meet a new Christian, I say, pick up your Bible, read it. Do not worry about what you do not understand. You just keep plowing through it until God gives you something and then you stop there and meditate on that. Because I did not understand, I'm lost, right? I did not understand a great deal. Not sure I do now, but. Yeah. It is the King James. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. <laughs> God save me. The Bible I was reading was the King James Bible. Church I went to used it. I've been using it ever since. If you use something different, I'm not going to fight with you over it. Unless you want to fight, but I don't want to. And, uh, uh, but yes, I've used it my whole Christian life. Hey, you won't get a fight out of Frank. No, okay. <laughs> I'm not interested in fighting with people. 
so. But if, anyway. Question. Somebody have one. Back here on the left, there was a hand go up. Yes, sir. You mentioned a meeting where the character of the church afterwards changed. I wondered if you might expound a little bit on what it changed from and if there was any sense of momentum in the life of the church that brought you to that point or if it was entirely spontaneous and unexpected. I'm trying to think of what I said. Where the character of the church changed? Did I? He's talking about the movement in, in 89. Oh, oh, he's talking about that? Okay. Yes. Um, for, four, for four years we had been praying that God would open up doors for us to, to be able to start other churches. But also we've been examining ourselves and, and our prayer meetings oftentimes would have uh, uh, times in it where there would be a confession and... Um, and, and we were just seeking the Lord to do for us more than what we were seeing in our church. We were not content with what I used to call and still do status quo religion. I'm not interested in that. Christianity is a walk with God. And if you walk with God, and you, there, God is infinite. We're finite. And so there has to be a... I believe if you're walking with God, there has to be something in the heart that says, I want to know. Paul wrote the book of Philippians after many, many years of ministry under divine inspiration, more than half of the New Testament. And as he closes out the book of Philippians, he, that I may know him. Philippians 3. Now here's a man that has been lifted up to the third heaven. He knows things that none of us in this room have ever, will ever know. And yet the heart of the man was that I may know him. So from that was that sort of a burden that was slowly growing in our church. And then in 1989, we had our annual Bible conference, and God just sort of settled down like dew on mown grass um, and just sort of ministered to us. We, um, we ended up with an eight-week meeting, and uh, God, uh, when I said the character of the church was changed, God met with us in ways that we had not experienced before. And what that did was that uh, whetted our appetite for even more and uh, a, a greater desire. And then we saw God open up doors here and there and begin to, to move. And it just confirmed in us that, you know, God was with us and God was for us. And we had a sense that when we met, uh, we were meeting with God. We wanted to meet with God. I wish I could say to you that every meeting was a special, blessed meeting. And uh, th there were times like that, even after 89. We would meet and it seemed like God would just draw near. And, and, and it was just a blessing. And then we'd have a service. And it, 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 there's no question God was there, but it was different. And so, I don't know if you've ever had a devotion where it felt like it just wasn't quite and then the next time you meet with, with a devotion and it's like, wow, right? I, I think if you're a Christian here, you know something of what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Well, the wow is what I was looking for. <laughs> that time when the Lord draws a little bit closer. And so our church changed from that perspective. Yes, sir. You're next, sir. You start churches, how... How do you determine when it's okay to leave? You know, brother, I wish I had an, an ABC one, two, three answer on that. I, you know, we pray, we start a church, we we labor uh, uh, in the mission field. You start a church, there's no pastors, um, and then we go to another area and start churches. Acts, you read the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. Paul is on uh, the first missionary journey and he's going up and then he's coming down again back to Antioch or coming back to Antioch and he's ordaining elders in churches that he's organized. Which means there weren't any before that. They were functioning churches. And so we uh, encourage the men to read. We encourage the men to, uh, to lead. We encourage... And then as God was working in the church... Um, all the men were fearful to use the Word of God and preach, so, okay, don't preach. Just open up the Word of God and read it. And then somebody would 
after f several months, would say, well, let me share something. And then, and then another would, and it'd just fall flat. And then another time they would meet, and let me share something. And, and God began to raise up. And a year and a half later, two years later, this is the one who's the pastor. And um, we didn't force it. We didn't go to the religious world looking for pastors. We waited on the Lord. And, um, but we were not present all the time. We were driven out of Tripra because of uh, false accusations. Uh, the man that I was working with could go back in from time to time, uh, and he did. Um, and we stayed in communication with him. So these were churches that were on their own and, uh, and sustained themselves with, with little you know, in the beginning. And so sometimes providentially, Paul was driven out of Thessalonica. And the next thing we hear, he's writing a letter. You know, don't pick up the phone and talk to somebody's stuff. He writes a letter. And that church is continuing faithful. Uh, and eventually God uh, blesses them with leadership and so forth. So we're just, there is no ABC. If you do this, this is what's going to happen stuff. It's just you waiting on the Lord to do what God's going to do in God's church. The, the, the brother back here with the beard. <laughs> yeah, brother, thank you. Yes, sir. And I know there's no ABC yes. method, but I was wondering if you could tell us some of the things you would do to start a church. And also, uh, knowing that India has a thousand languages, how did you work through all these languages? Uh, two questions. For, let me answer the first one. First one, I, I always started with a handful of people. Not many. Sometimes two or three families, uh, counting myself and my wife. And, and, then, and then we would just start there and start knocking on doors, start visiting people and in the community and start passing out tracts. And um, when we started Elmendorf in July of 83, the, the whole community, every time we'd knock on a door, you're never, that church has been thus and thus, uh, you're never going to build a church here. One person said, if, if, if I'm going to build a church in this place, you're going to have to throw away that Bible. And, and uh, I'm going to throw away a lot of stuff, but I'm not going to throw away my Bible. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's what we heard for years. All right, we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. But finally, and there'd be one, and then there'd be another, and then there'd be another, and somebody would let somebody else know, and, and, and sometimes somebody would show up, and, hey, I don't even know who this person is. I didn't knock on any doors this week. There's no face here. And they just showed up because they drove down the road and saw the sign. And so God builds his own church in God's own time, and we just wait on the Lord. And there is no time frame. We try to be faithful. We try to pray. We're here because we believe God wants us here, and we're just going to wait and see what God's going to do. In terms of language in India, people ask me all the time, did you learn the language? And I said, which one? <laughs> because actually there are, are a, a, a more than 1,000 major languages and more than 8,000 dialects. Even among the tribals, uh, which we had focused on the tribals of Northeast India, there was... Uh, several different languages and several different dialects. Twenty-seven different tribes, uh, tribal groups lived in the city of Guwahati when we were there. Uh, and each one had their own little congregation. And so we chose, Eng English is a second language. Uh, the second year that we were there, God gave us a man who could speak nine different languages. Very, uh, somewhat common over there for, for uh, Christian people particularly to have a have a basket full of languages that they can not only understand but pr and speak. And God uh, actually used him. He became basically my shadow and for, he was my Timothy. And for the next nine years, uh, wherever I was, he was. And, uh, and I trained him and taught him and we built a library and we started churches together and he's carrying on the ministry over there now. So I did not learn any of the languages on purpose. Because once you learn a language over there, you're focused on that alone, right? And our, our ministry was Northeast India. As, as, and we, and I want to reach as many of those seven states as possible. So, yes, sir, in the back. So if I did my math right, 47 years or so you've walked with the Lord. So yes, yes, since, uh, since uh, the summer of, of uh, 75, yes, sir. Guaranteed to say there's 
say there's been valleys. Uh, yes, absolutely, so for sure. Times in the valleys, in those times of discouragement, what are, what are maybe one or two or three different texts that you go to that help you, that they continue to spur you on, that, that are kind of your intimate friends that you go back to that remind you? Uh, brother, I don't have a text. I genuinely don't. I don't go to it. Oh, I remember this verse. I don't. What I do pretty regularly is I read the Psalms uh, and Proverbs, read through the Psalms and Proverbs every month. My wife and I, um, she said, I'm like a little child. When I'm hurt, got my feelings hurt, I run right back to the book of Psalms. <laughs> so, and so we have our morning devotions. And, and it's not that I'm reading, not reading other portions of scriptures. Wherever I'm at in, in my trying to read through the scripture that year, I'll read that too. But we have our morning devotions, and, it's, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to open up. Today's the fifth, so I'm going to start with Psalm 5. And, I'm gonna, and I've got this system worked out where I'm reading you know, five psalms uh, every day for 30 days, 150 psalms, and I'm through with the book of Psalms, plus one proverb, one chapter of Proverbs. Um, 31 days, that's this month, we read Psalm 119. <laughs> and so, uh, and I've done it for years. I've done it for, whew, I don't know how many years. Many. And so, we've recently been through some very, very difficult uh, things, my wife and I. Um, but there has been an abiding peace and rest in our soul through this whole thing. Uh, I don't have an, a lot of answers for a lot of things, but I've got a sense that in the midst of this, God is here. And so he knows the way. I'm just going to wait and see. But I go to the book of Psalms. There's nothing that you can experience that is not written on the pages of the book of Psalms. Nothing. And I just read. And... Most of the time, there'll be a verse here, a verse there, and I'll just latch on to it. Uh, and the next day, there's another verse or whatever, and I'll latch on to it. And, uh, and I'm reading, right? I'm not skipping anything. But sometimes it's only a verse. Sometimes it's only a phrase out of a verse. So I don't go to a text. I don't have any. I genuinely do not. <laughs> Yeah, Brother Pat, do you have any favorite texts? Yeah, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 21-20. <laughs> That's my favorite text. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, brother. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the ministry and the growth of the wooden, that old wooden uh, oh. in the middle of the cornfield in Elmendorf. Yeah, the Lord blessed us in that building. How much time do we have, brother? I don't want to overstate. Uh, five or ten minutes. All right. Yeah. Yeah, my wife and I, we're burdened to start a work on our side of town in the area. I had seen an, an empty uh, a church building uh, southwest of where we lived. We drove over there. It had, been, it had burned down. And um, we could have met in our house. We had, an, uh, we had some acreage. We had a vacant uh, mobile, single-wide mobile home. We could have met there. We just felt that in this community... Um, uh, people w would come into a church building instead of a house. We, we'd opened up, we'd started a ministry in our house in the beginning. And so I'm not opposed to that. So we were praying and fasting and we were seeking the Lord's face. And we were driving around. I'm looking for a church building. <laughs> and so uh, I'm driving around 1604 and we get, I've never been down this road before. So I turned left off there going off the Labus Road. And there's a, there's a vacant church building. Weeds are, are high, almost hip high to me. Just been vacant a long time. And, and that building leaned this way and that way. And I'm thinking, wow, look at that building. That's neat. <laughs> Nobody can see. <laughs> Nobody, I think, can understand what it is for me to find a vacant church building. Uh, but anyway, walking around through the weeds and the doors are locked. There's one window, you know, loose. And I push up the window. We crawl in. I... I know, I know. No for sale sign. Nothing. And uh, open the door for my wife. She's not willing to crawl through the window. <laughs> and uh, we walk around. This is neat. And so we knelt down and prayed that if it was the Lord's will, he'd give us that building. 
And I closed the window and walked away and started asking questions in the community. Who owns this building? Who owns that? And, well, this, you check with this one and check with that one and check with this one. And, this, and nobody, and finally, about um, several weeks later, oh, uh, there's a deacon over in, in, in this church that, that uh, I think owns that building. So we contacted him, and, and he indeed owned the building. He wanted uh, to see a Baptist church established. He had had opportunities, he'd only for five years, had opportunities for five years to sell it. Uh, people were contacting him, wanting to buy it. No, no, I want to see a Baptist church there. So I called him, and we met, and we didn't have any money. I mean, we had a handful of people. We didn't have hardly any money. Uh, this is the rent, and if you can't pay it this month, don't worry about it. We'll take, we're, I want to see a church established here, Baptist church here. And so it went that way, and after a few years, I found out he was taking all the rent money and putting it into a, a fund for a down payment. Because uh, he wanted to sell the building in one acre of land for $15,000, and, uh, and we wanted it. And the well went out, and he came out and replaced the water well. I mean, he just, just did everything. Found out I was a contractor and said, my house needs to be painted. And I walked in. I said, brother, your house don't need no paint to be painted. I want my house painted, brother Pat. <laughs> put me to work for three weeks and just um, and then he got cancer inoperable brain tumor and uh, he said I called me he said I'm having a good day my wife is here my son is here and he said uh, you come over come over today come over now bring your checkbook with you and he said um, uh, how much do you owe uh, on this I said I think we owe five thousand four hundred dollars we have paid nine thousand six hundred so far and he said, that's my record also. And he wrote, turned to his wife. He said, write, uh, write them a check for $5,400. And he said, Brother Pat, you write me a check for $5,400. I'm going to die, and I want that property clear. And in y'all's name. And two weeks later, he was gone. And in our 10th anniversary, we, she was still alive. We invited her, had a meeting, 10th anniversary, and brought her here. And, just re re rehearsed the story of how one man helped a church get started just out of a burden that he wanted to see a, a church in that area. And he, he had no idea what God was going to do. I didn't either. And God just did an amazing thing, and he used him to help us get the building. So I think my time is up. Okay, brother? Brother, maybe you can briefly share. I just want... I like this story because it speaks to faith and trusting God. And maybe you can share the time where you were preaching. And it was, you know, just a few families at the time. And I don't know, somebody had to go to the nursery. I don't remember what the situation was, but it, you, you basically were preaching to an empty room. You just kept on preaching, trusting the Lord. I, as I said, we had a, a three families and one left, right? So I left four adults. And, of course, with four adults... If one's sick or the children are sick and mama stays home or, um, and so, yeah, there were, uh, it wasn't just one time, brother, but it, there were times when um, it was my wife and I, or it was times when my wife and I and, and, and a couple of our children, and, and uh, in the wintertime, the toilet froze. It was so cold in that building. <laughs> And we'd sit around this little wall heater, uh, gathered up around this little wall heater, and every time the f fan would come on to blow the heat out, it would blow out these black specks. And you'd have to be far enough away not to get black on you and close enough to get warm. And it was, it was an amazing time. Uh, but it was a hard time because nobody was coming. And yet we were convinced God wanted us there. All I'm going to do is trust the Lord, right? God's going to build His church. That's what the Scripture says. God has to build His church. Uh, I, that's all I know. So we wait. Trust the Lord. And then in February, a family came. Praise the Lord. And then some more. And we were up to eight. No, 12. We were up to 12 families. And we had a disciplinary situation. We lost four families. And the next year, one-third of our finances were lost when one family left. And, and just, uh, and then starting over again. And just, and, and then there was this huge mess in 88. We're, now, this is the fifth year, right? 88 is the fifth year. And then we get through all of that. And 
God just blesses us in 89. Everything turned around. Everything turned around. There is no one time I can point to with that. But just, you know, brethren, just God is faithful. Trust Him. Do I take this off? Amen. But yeah, that's encouraging. Um, so David's not here yet. Oh, he's going to be here in one minute. He's going to be ready to be baptized in one minute. How about we we meet in the parking lot in 15 minutes, brethren, and we'll for the baptism. Give him 15 minutes. Y'all can visit the restroom if you need to, and. Plan on that, and then we'll come in here for the second service. All right, thank you. You may not feel very close to the Lord. In fact, you may, you may be really struggling hard and overcome with a lot of dark thoughts and and discouraging feelings in your soul and you don't really feel up and very very excited and you wonder even if you're going to make it you're going to wonder if you're going to but even in this the lord if he began a good work in you is working even in this to train you and teach you and make you understand that this life is not primarily a life of feelings it is not primarily a life of passion it is a life of faith we must believe. We must trust. And sometimes we have to take that scripture that says that Christ may be rooted in our heart by faith. That we have to sometimes take by faith that Christ is in our hearts. Sometimes we don't feel that Christ is in our hearts. But we have to take it by faith because the scripture says so and we know we have believed. And then we would take the word of God as true. My dad asked me to preach his funeral. When I preached it. I told the people, I don't know. I said, you all know my dad was not a good man. But I said, I've come here. My dad wanted me to speak to you. I said, I've come here to tell you that God saves bad people. I said, you know, my dad was not a good man. I said, he's my dad. I can say that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to gloss this thing over. I'm not going to make it look good. You, they know my dad had a foul mouth. My dad was a womanizer. My dad was a drunk. My dad was a chronic liar. He had one of the most filthy mouths you could ever hear on a man. But my dad was calling on the Lord at the end. In order to be a true believer, in order to be a child of God, the Holy Son of God was forsaken by His Father and then crushed under His own Father's punishment. You say, oh, Brother Paul, you've gone too far now. Have you not read Isaiah 53.10? It pleased the Lord to crush him. Take a 10,000-pound millstone and put another on top of it. Put a grain of wheat between them and see what you've got when it comes out on the other end. Take a dam, a hundred thousand miles high and a hundred thousand miles wide and have it break in front of you. And as the, the torrent of water rolls down towards you to engulf you, to destroy you, all of a sudden the ground opens up and drinks it down and not one drop splashes to your feet. And so Christ raised his hand up to heaven and took the wrath of God, that great cup, and drank it down. And when he cried out, it is finished, he turned it over and not one drop came out. He drank the wrath of God and satisfied justice and appeased wrath and therefore God can now be just and justify the sinner. This is what he's done. This is what he has done. The Puritans spoke a lot about repentance, not only from sin, but repentance from good works. You say, what do you mean? There is a real sense in which repentance is simply this. You give up from trying to justify 
yourself. You just quit. You see that every one of your most righteous deeds is more than filthy rags, and you detest them, and you throw them to the floor, and you stand there before God and say, unless you move on my behalf, I am damned. And you believe. You believe. You trust. There is a deacon in my church back home, a little church in the middle of a cornfield. And I love this man. He's walked with God longer than I've been alive. And he remembers telling me one, one time he told me about his conversion. He said, I was a, a good fella as fellas go. He said, but the preacher said something that morning and it stirred my heart and I thought, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? He went up in his hayloft and he was just walking around. And he said he found himself finally with his toes hanging over the edge of the loft, just kind of standing there. He said, all of a sudden, it just dawned on me. And this is what he said. Lord, I am going to trust, place my confidence exclusively, only, in what your Son has done for me. And if that very thing, if what He has done for me is not strong enough to save me, then I will go to hell because I will not trust in another thing. Right now, if this preacher died, he would go to heaven. Not because I spent years in the jungles in the Andes Mountains of Peru. Not because of piety, devotion, or Bible study. Not because of denominational affiliation, baptism, or participation in the Lord's Supper. If I died right now, I would go to heaven because 2,000 years ago, the Son of God shed His blood for this wretched man. And that is my hope. And I expect that that scarlet thread is strong enough to hold me when I swing out into eternity upon it. Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com. There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs, and methodologies, and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve. So I want to talk to you about the most important thing in all of existence. This news that I want to tell you is the most important news you will ever hear in your entire life. The issue is this, that man and God are at odds with one another. You, sir, ma'am, friend, there's a conflict, there's a war, there's a battle, and you are an opposing side to the Lord Almighty. You may say, how did I get here? This is news I haven't heard before. I, I don't doubt you may not have heard that, but that doesn't in any way take away from the reality that it is true. See, the, the, the situation is this, that God is holy, holy, holy. He's true. He's almighty. He's perfect. He's good. He is awesome. And no one, no, 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 no one questions this. The Bible is, is filled with examples of scriptures that talk about His majesty. And I think of Isaiah 6, 1, that, that, that talks about the holiness of our God. He is, he is amazing. Now, while this is all true and we say amen to this, there is another truth, and that is that you are not. You, God is good, God is mighty, He is perfect, but you are not. You are not good, you are not perfect. In fact, far from being perfect, you are sinful. In Psalm 51, we are told that we are shapen in iniquity and sin that our mothers conceive us. We are born sinful. This is a problem. See, when Adam sinned, when Adam rebelled against God, all of creation was put underneath the dark cloud of God's curse. Judgment has fallen on all of humanity and we are now born with the heart that is set upon doing evil. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone our own way. See, there is a God who sits upon a throne. He is king. And yet we have rebelled against His reign. We have rebelled against His authority. We have gone 
not as just neglecting him, but as willfully and violently opposing him because we have loved our sin. We have chosen our sin. We have chosen the things that God hates. And this creates a problem. In fact, you can say that it creates two problems. For the reality is that God only accepts perfection. Jesus, he said, you therefore must be perfect as my Father is perfect. Perfection is the standard. It will not be lowered for you or for me or for anyone else. Perfection is the standard. Only perfect people get to heaven. The problem is, as I've already alluded to, that we are not perfect. We have broken the laws of God. We have not believed Him. We have not loved Him. We have not served Him. We have not honored Him. We have not worshipped Him as He is worthy to be worshipped. This is the first problem. But it gets worse. It doesn't just stop that we have disobeyed him. See, every sin has a consequence. The wages of sin is death. There's a punishment. And that is the very anger and fury and wrath of God. So not only have we disobeyed God, but that disobedience has resulted in a consequence. And that consequence is the wrath of God and it is approaching. The people who are watching this, there may be many differences from you and me, but here's something that is true. It is appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. The reality is this, is that you, sir, you ma'am, will face death. Death is coming and death, when it comes for you, the Bible talks about it coming suddenly. Life is a vapor, is a mist. It's here and then it's gone. You don't know when it is coming, but it is coming for you. And when it comes for you, that consequence that your sins have earned you will fall upon you. See, eternity is forever. The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. These are the two problems that all of humanity faces. You face this. You have disobeyed God and because you've disobeyed Him there is a wrath that is coming for you and death is the gateway to get you there and you don't know when you're going to die and you can see why this would be a problem. This is bad news. But our God who is so holy, so mighty, so kind, though we are in a position that makes us helpless. See, you can't earn perfection after you've broken the law of God. You cannot cry and plead and ask for forgiveness in any way that would remove the wrath of God. That doesn't do it. Your works are not going to remove the wrath of God. Your efforts are not going to do it. Your tears are not going to do it. Your church attendance, dressing up, dressing down, at good works, uh, volunteering, charity, none of those things are going to satisfy the wrath of God and none of those things are going to allow you to be perfect. It's not gonna meet the requirement. So what does? Well, this is the good news that I wanna to bring to you, why it's so important. See, the Father sent His Son the good news is that Jesus Christ came into this world, born of a virgin, perfect, sinless, spotless, the spotless Lamb of God, and He came to do what? To obey where we have disobeyed. He came to fulfill the law of God. He satisfied the righteous requirement of the law. And why is this good news? Because, like I said, only perfection gets you into heaven, and none of us are perfect, but Jesus Christ came and He lived perfectly. And not just that, oh, after he satisfied the law, after he was obedient to the point of death, he surrendered his life to the cross. He surrendered his life to be a sacrifice. See, like I said, one problem, none of us are perfect. We have all sinned, but problem two, that we deserve a punishment. We deserve a consequence. And that consequence is not just death, but it is eternal death. Well, Jesus Christ upon the cross, he surrendered himself to take upon himself the due penalty that we all deserve, the wrath of God. It was laid upon him. On the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, on the cross, Jesus Christ was paying our debt, his blood, which is a picture of his life, was satisfying the righteous requirement. It was satisfying the wrath. It was satisfying what we need to be forgiven. It was satisfying all that is needed in order for us to be accepted by God.
and he dies. He really dies for he's both God and man. He really lays down his life and he's put into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea as it was prophesied. But three days later, he comes back to life with a promise. See, he has conquered death. He has conquered the enemy, Satan. He has conquered sin. And he comes back with a promise that everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. See, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did in his perfect life and what he did in his sacrificial death and what he did in his victorious resurrection, you, no matter what you've done, no matter how many sins you've committed, no matter how many times you've done it, no matter what the blasphemy, no matter what the shame, you, sir, you, ma'am, will be saved. Saved from what? Saved not only from hell, and the wrath of God, but saved from the power of sin that has you a slave. See, the Bible talks about sin being a slave master and you being a slave of sin. And you're chained to those masters, chained to those sins. And no matter how much you look at freedom and say, I want freedom from pornography, I want freedom from adultery, I want freedom from lying, freedom from pride, freedom from anger, freedom from idolatry, freedom from whatever sin has you bound, you may say, yes, I want freedom. And you may experience a little bit of relief for a week or two, but what do you know? You know like I know, you find yourself slaved and chained to that master once again. Back to the old things. Why? Because you're a slave and you can't free yourself. But what Jesus Christ did on the cross is he smashed those chains. He tore apart the bars. He opened the gates wide so that we could be free to obey him and to want to. He gives us a new heart, new affections, new desires. He changes you supernaturally. The Holy Spirit comes. He lives within you. He gives you a new heart, new affections, new desires. And you walk victoriously, forgiven of all of your sin, empowered to live righteously and promised that you will be with Christ forever in heaven. This is the good news. This is the news we want to bring to you. This is the news that can save you, that can finally set you free from all the things that you've tried all your life to be free from. Here is the news, the message of Christ and Him crucified. God has always brought revivals to souls, to churches, to nations, to missionary work. The first Great Awakening, 1730s through 1780s, Britain was gone, morally de horrendously worse, really, than even what we see now in America. God raised up George Whitfield and the Wesleys, Jonathan Edwards in, in New England, and just through the preaching and praying of God's people, God sent rivers from heaven and turned the tide. And the gospel swept the British Isles. George Whitfield preached in Boston when the population was 12,000. And Benjamin Franklin estimated there were 14,000 people there that day. They came from everywhere. It was like a prairie fire. Fast forward. 1857-58, the Fulton Street Prayer Revival. How many of you know about that? Fulton Street, Manhattan, right near Ground Zero Memorial, right there. The North Dutch Reformed Church, Fulton Street. A young evangelist, city missionary they called him, Jeremiah Lamphere, had a burden. He said, you know, I think it's a good idea maybe to start a prayer meeting for businessmen. He did. He put up flowers about it. And first day, he was there and nobody else. And then suddenly, two came in, three came in, five came in. And within months, around New York City, there were 50,000 people gathering at noon in prayer meetings. They couldn't find buildings big enough to hold them. And that prayer revival Hundreds began to be converted. And within a year, there were 50,000 re recorded conversions and people joined the evangelical churches in the day when you didn't walk the aisle, sign a card, and you're a member. No, you were examined to see if your profession was credible. 50,000 filled the churches of New York City in the greater area. And that prayer revival spread west like a prairie fire. All around the South to South Texas, all the way to California. God ignited 
a huge season of revival in prayer. Fast forward quickly, 1949-52, Hebrides Islands of Scotland. Duncan Campbell was an evangelist. He was preaching in England. But there were two little praying ladies in Scotland, in the Hebrides. Peggy and Sue. Catherine. Thank you, historian. Peggy and Catherine. Peggy and Sue, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a Western song, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, two little women whose ministry was intercession in their house. They had never been married. Hey guys if, and ladies, if you don't ever get married, God doesn't do that. Give yourself to a ministry of intercession. It's the biggest need. A lot of young guys want to preach and teach. How many of them want to give themselves to a life of prayer? So these ladies started praying. They had a burden. And they, they called their minister to come by. And they said, we believe God wants to bring Duncan Campbell here. Would you send him a telegram or whatever? Well, he respected these ladies, so he did. Campbell replied, I couldn't come for two years. I'm just booked. So the minister comes back and tells the ladies, and to which one of them said, that's what Duncan Campbell says, but God says he's coming. <laughs> he's preaching on a platform in a, in a conference in England. He's supposed to bring the closing message, and he's overwhelmed with his burden that he needed to leave and go to Scotland. He does. He leaves, ultimately gets on a boat to go to the Hebrides Islands. He arrives, I don't know, two days, three days later. He gets off the boat, and there's a man standing there who says, Are you Mr. Campbell? Are you walking with God? Well, there's a meeting in the church tonight you're going to preach at. He said, How did you know I was coming? He said, how did you know to come? God was at work. And the Spirit of God swept those Hebrides Islands. Many, many conversions. I don't have time to tell that story. Fast forward, 1971, Western Canada. Bill McLeod. They were having a crusade, two weeks of meetings. The Spirit of God fell. And... Hundreds were converted. They couldn't find buildings big enough for the crowds that began to come. And it swept Western Canada and parts of the northern states, northwestern states in America. God has always brought revivals. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He comes suddenly, surprisingly, mysteriously, sometimes like a gentle breeze, sometimes like a gushing wind. It's like a snowball rolling down a snow-covered hill. It's growing. It's like a gentle light rain increasing and more keeps coming until a downpour soaks everything. The wind, the wind was blowing. That's how you explain Pentecost. The wind was blowing. Acts 4, they pray the house is shaken and they're all filled with the Spirit of God. The wind was blowing. We need, brothers and sisters, for the wind to blow. Your church needs it. Our church needs it. More than 50 years, Christians around the world have profited from listening to the preaching of the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Born in the last month of the 19th century, he was a Welsh medical doctor converted to Christ in the midst of his medical pursuits, eventually laying aside a prestigious medical career for the Christian ministry. Dr. Lloyd-Jones is widely regarded as the greatest preacher of the 20th century, and probably the most prominent reason for this is the way that God's anointing rested upon him, enabling him to so preach and teach the Word of God that listeners were regularly brought into a real encounter with God through His Word. The one thing He tells you to be concerned about is this, is your own soul. 
your relationship to God. And it's something which is intensely personal. You see, he talks about entering into a straight gate. And I always think that this straight gate is not like we used to have it on the pictures that the old people used to hang on their walls. I think this straight gate was a turnstile. And you know the point about a turnstile, don't you? It only admits one person at a time. You can't go two of you together into a turnstile. Husband and wife can't go together. Father and mother can't go together. Parents and children into the turnstile one by one. That's the straight gate. You and God. Your parents may have been the most saintly people that Pensacola has ever known. That doesn't save you. Every one of us has got to come to a private, personal, individual meeting with God. We can't ride into heaven on the back of saintly forebears. We can't be saved in nations or churches or towns or districts or communities. Every one of us has to come alone, face to face with God, personal. He narrows it down to this. The eyes of the fool, says the Old Testament word, are on the ends of the earth. And people are talking tonight about the war in Vietnam and this problem and the other and the church is talking about all these things and people are saying God ought to do this and that. My dear friend, those are not the questions. The question is, do you know God? The book by Martin Lloyd-Jones, titled Spiritual Depression, started out as a series of 24 sermons preached on Sunday mornings at Westminster Chapel, London. The original recordings have been digitized and are now available from the Martin Lloyd-Jones Recordings Trust. In 1965, these sermons were gathered together and edited for publication by Dr. Lloyd-Jones, now consisting of 21 chapters, generally coinciding with the sermons originally delivered. In the sermons, and on the printed page, there is a remarkable and rare depth of application. In our days, there are many people talking about the need to recover the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture for the Christian life. But Dr. Lloyd-Jones's treatment of depression demonstrated that belief in a greater way than most have done. These great arguments of the epistles, this tremendous presentation of truth. The gospel isn't a partial thing. He takes in the whole of men, the whole of life, the whole of history, the whole of world. He tells you about creation. He tells you about the final judgment and everything in between. It's a complete, a whole view of life. And I'm saying this morning that many are unhappy in the Christian life because they've never realized that. They have never realized that it is a way of life. That it caters for the whole of a man's life and covers every eventuality in his experience. That there is no aspect or phase of his life and of his activity, but that the gospel has something to say about it. The whole of life must come under it because it's all inclusive. The gospel is meant to control and to govern everything in our life. And if we don't realize that, we are certain sooner or later to find ourselves in an unhappy condition. You and I, and to me this is one of the great discoveries in the Christian life, I shall never forget the release that realizing this for the first time brought to me. You and I must never look at our past lives we must never look at any sin in our past life in such a way except it should lead us to praise God and to magnify His grace as Paul did. I challenge you with that. If you look at your past or anything in your past and are depressed by it, you're failing miserably as a Christian. That doesn't mean that I say you should look at your past and say nothing. No, no, you must do it as Paul did. I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But does he stop at that? Does he sit in his corner and say I'm unworthy to be a preacher of the gospel? No, he says the exact opposite. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful. 
putting me into the ministry. When Paul looks at that past, he doesn't sit down in a corner and say, I'm unfit to preach, I'm not worthy to be a Christian. Alas, I lack, I'm such a vile man, I've done such terrible things. Not at all. What he does to Paul is to make him praise God. He magnifies the grace, listen, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the way to look at your past. So if you look at your past and are just depressed, it means you're listening to the devil. But if you look at that past and say, yes, unfortunately it was true. I was blinded by the God of this world. I did it in ignorance and unbelief. But thank God his grace was more abundant and abounding. It was more than sufficient. And his love and mercy came upon me in such a way. It's all forgiven and I'm a new man. Then it's all right. That's the way I say to look at the past, and if we don't do that, I'm almost tempted to say that we deserve to be miserable. Why believe the devil instead of believing God? Rise up out of it, my friend, and realize the truth about yourself as in Christ and one with him, and that all the past, whatever it may be, has gone and has been blotted out once and forever. Let us remember that it is sin to doubt God's word. It is sin to allow the past which God has dealt with to rob us of our joy and our usefulness in the present and in the future. It isn't the time of your entry into the kingdom that matters but the fact that you're in the kingdom. That's the thing that matters. It isn't even the mode or the manner of your conversion that matters. What matters is the fact that you're converted. But people will sit down and worry about the way they've come in. They haven't got somebody else's experience. Or it didn't happen in this precise way or manner. Time, mode, manner, method. It doesn't matter. What matters is, are you in? If you're in, well rejoice in it and forget that you were ever out. The time element is quite unimportant.
All right, brethren, we'll try to get ourselves seated to begin the service. Yeah. All right, brethren, if we could please find a seat. That was uh, our brother David with his holy whistle. <laughs> that is, a quite, that is a quite an effective uh, gift you have there. <laughs> All right, just a, a number of announcements here before we get started. Uh, Sister Connie has started to put names on the whiteboard back there for those who are assigned uh, kitchen duties. So you go back there, you see your name on there, it means you're, you're expected to help with the, the kitchen duties. I suppose the dates are on there, right? Or is it just the current Sunday? Yeah, the current Sunday. So if your name's on there, you're, you're, you're assigned to be involved in that, uh, in that service. Um, I saw Omar. I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I was wondering how Stephanie was doing. Do we have any kind of update, brother? I think I see you. Any kind of update on your wife or how she's doing? Doing a lot better. Continue to pray for her. Um, it's a very difficult trial that many, many brethren have experienced in the church, losing a child. And uh, we have another pregnancy situation. We saw the email about Andrea. She has a tear in her uterus, and so she's going to probably be bedridden until um, time of delivery. She's sitting at 28 weeks right now, and uh, brethren continue to pray for her. Thankful that brethren are lined up to help them with uh, with food and uh, you know send her some encouraging messages. Thankful for. The body's love and that capacity, it's very common, and I'm thankful to God for that. Our brother Kevin, I didn't get, a, I didn't get an update on him. Is Crystal, where are you at, sister? 
I don't know where he's at, but continue to pray for his health. Tuesday night uh, is going to be the shift taking place in the ethics study, uh, moving it from Saturday to, to Tuesday. So this Tuesday will be, will be resuming that. Jeff will be resuming that study at 7 p.m. This Wednesday, finally, we have grace groups. <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't put that aside. It's just been a while. And so don't, don't show up at the building unless you're Spanish-speaking, right? Are you, are you guys still meeting here? Or? Okay. I guess you got a group thread, right? Check with the group and where, where that meeting's going to take place. Um, yeah, we're just 13 days away from the woman's study. Uh, our sister Leah is going to be uh, leading that. It will not be live streamed, but it will be recorded audio. So if you're not able to make it yet, you'll be able to listen to that. Um, we did want to uh, emphasize any mothers who are not able to to find someone to watch their children. You, you are certainly welcome to come and bring your children. But it would be great if we get some young ladies here to, to volunteer to watch the children when they're here so the mothers could most benefit from the time. That would be fantastic. And so, Lord willing, that will be launching a week from the coming Saturday, the 13th. We want to continue to pray for our brother John and Evan and Josh and Nepal. Um, any update on them? Specific updates? Um, of course, the Haven, Haven for Hope outreach, uh, they've given permission to, to uh, have the chapel for an hour starting. I don't know when, the, when that's going to start. Where's Adrian at? Where's Hunter? When? Oh, when were, when were you going to start the, the Haven for Hope at meeting in the chapel? You don't know yet? Okay, next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah, what an opportunity, brethren, for that. So pray for that effort. And, uh, of course, these Afghan kids that were just here previous week for VBS, praying for their souls. We want to remember our sister Demi in Lebanon. She's... Uh, She's encountered some difficulties. I mean, she was having stomach problems when she got there and then went to see the doctor, put on antibiotics, and then she seemed to be having problems with I'm just going to read this text she sent. I mean, just kind of tapping into the first hour. I mean, you seek to advance the kingdom of God. It's, it's not going to be without trials and difficulties and resistance and opposition and... She says, I was on antibiotics because I had a bug, and the bug went away, but I had horrible side effects from the antibiotics, so I stopped. And this past week, I had an allergic reaction to something, not sure what it was, and my hand swelled up, and my lip just overall wasn't feeling well. My stomach just hasn't been doing well in general here. So it's just been one thing after another. I was so discouraged, my heart was just in the wrong place, which was more frustrating than the physical. But instead of stubbornly fighting under this providence, which I have felt like I've been doing in, in the worst case anyway, the Lord is teaching me to just patiently endure. I read this quote from John Flavel. Do you want your heart to rest only in the bosom of God? What better method could providence take to accomplish your desire than pulling from under your head that soft pillow of creaturely delights in which you rested before? which has been my prayer, and God has been answering. Not in the way I anticipated, but nonetheless answering. And that's, I think, I think about every Christian can say that, right? <laughs> you're praying, you have something in mind when you're praying. God actually answers it, but it's not, not quite the way you were thinking he was going to answer it. And we can be assured when God answers our prayers, it's going to be to the end that he's glorified. And so that's why it's oftentimes not the way we thought it would be. But yeah, our sister has been under great trials since being there in Lebanon, and we're thankful she's persevering and God's teaching her things. And that's the fact that's what we prayed when she left, right? That she would draw near to the Lord. It'd be a spiritually fruitful time there in the two months she spends. And Destiny, I didn't see you earlier, but just letting you know I got your curriculum. <laughs> All right. Um, 
All right, brethren, let's, how about we pray? And Father, on that note, just think of that, that psalm. We were talking about psalms earlier in Psalm 2.8. Ask of me and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Lord, I remember Brother Pat mentioning that verse often in the early days, in my early days here. And Lord, it is so when we've been gripped with such a burden and, and believe you for such promises Lord, it is met with resistance in the kingdom of darkness. And, and Lord, it is a trial, this, this life. You said in this world we'd have tribulations, but we're thankful you're with us in the tribulations. You never leave us or forsake us. And Father, we're thankful for having brethren that are desiring to leave the comforts of this place and, and go into other places. And or we think about our sister Demi, who's desiring to you know, utilize the gift she has of speaking Arabic and being able to teach these kids English and and pour into them and, and, and the gospel. And Lord, you, it's just been one trial after another. We thank, you, th we thank you for upholding our sister, Lord. We pray, Lord, bless their efforts there as they pour into these children. We pray that it would, it would result in, Lord, light, great light, dawning upon the darkness of that false religion and in the hearts of these children. Lord, you'd resurrect them with regeneration and Lord, the kind of thing we just celebrated outside in David's life, being brought from the dead, risen to walk in newness of life, the Lord Jesus. Father, pray you'd work there. Pray you'd help to continue to sustain Kevin as he leads the team. And in the absence of Dan, we pray you would use our brother here, give his family adequate rest. And, and Lord, in all the visits between the churches, you, you would allow that brother to impart great encouragement and great vision for uh, Lord, expand, extend, extending the gospel beyond the four walls of the church. Oh, Lord, help your people have a greater burden, a greater vision, a greater passion for the things you're passionate about. And Father, I think about our sister Andrea, who's not with us, would desire to be so. Lord, we thank you for the pregnancy. We've it's something they've been praying for, longing for. Lord, this discovery. We're, Lord, we're thankful that we have technology where this was able to be discovered. Pray you give our sister rest. We pray you'd meet with her and help her and draw near to her in this time. Thankful for the brethren that have already committed to, you know, supply meals for the family. Lord, we pray you'd minister to the Espinosas in this season. Lord, we think of our sister Stephanie and how heartbroken her and her husband are. And Lord, help her. Draw near. Bless, Lord. I, I pray you'd minister to her. And our brother Kevin, who's just gone from one physical thing after another, Lord, you continue to bring him out of them one after another, Lord. You, you continue to show him in, in crystal faithfulness. And, and Lord, we pray you'd restore his health so he could uh, have a season, a stretch of season of serving you wholeheartedly and fully uh, in, in full strength. Lord, our strength comes from you. We have none outside of you, Lord. We can follow all kinds of diets. We can do all kinds of things. We can go to the gym. Lord, our health is completely dependent upon you. And Lord, I thank you, my brother. You, you enabled our, our brother Rick to be with us today. Lord, we don't want to presume upon our health. We owe everything to you. And we thank you for your abundant kindness, Lord, allowing us to gather together. Lord, even as is mentioned in the first hour, Lord, what you did in, in 89, Lord, is what we desire you to do every time we gather, Lord, that the presence of God Almighty and the power of the Holy Spirit would be known, would be felt, would be sensed, and Lord, we would be changed, and we would be transformed, and we would be helped, and, and, and Lord, with a deeper conviction, a deeper burden, Lord, the, the things of this world would grow strangely dim. Oh, Father, please, as we're in this body, in this world, may the things of it grow strangely dim, and may the, the glory of Jesus Christ ever become ever so more our heart and our desire and our life, Lord. And, and so, Father, I pray, I pray as my brother comes to the pulpit in, in a little bit that you would, Lord, you'd own the time. You would, get, you would as, as the illustration you used earlier, Lord, like, like fresh rain or dew upon the grass, Lord, you just settle upon this place and open up ears to hear. Lord, you would save. Lord, there's been lost people in this building for years, and 
children, Lord, we're crying out to you for lost family members, visitors, Lord, that need the gospel, that need to be rescued from their darkness. Lord, there's saints here, all kinds of issues and problems, and Lord, we need to be, Lord, we need grace to, to grow, to, to bring us, Lord, from faith to faith, and help us, Lord, in this journey. Get us to the end, Lord. And so I pray your word would be used to that end today. Lord, every message is a message of perseverance, one said, and rightly so. Pray, Lord, you'd be, you would uh, enable us to sing the songs of Zion and, and worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, you'd meet with us in the time of the table, the Lord's table now. Uh, Father, that Christ and the thoughts of him and our remembrance of him would be a precious time for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, Brother Roel, if you'd come forward at this time and read the scriptures. I don't know where you, there you are. We're going to be reading out of uh, Revelation 5. Revelation 5. Then, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the vo throne, I'm sorry, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Amen. Thank you, brother. If I can get the brothers to hand out the elements now. And we, we do invite you, if you're a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, to join us if you feel liberty to do that. Um, you don't have to be a member. Let me clarify that. We say that, but uh, it's not because we don't reg have any high regard for membership. It's, in, it's like instances like today. We have brethren here, dear brethren, that we want to give them the liberty to join us at the table. And um, certainly not because we don't put a premium on church membership. We, should, we feel that's very biblical. And obviously we've, we've preached on that, but I don't want anybody to to uh, misunderstand. It's just an, an invitation for those that are true, genuine, baptized believers to join us at the table. 
Uh, we highly prize be, uh, membership, and if you've been in this church for a long time and you're not a member, I mean, I, I would ask why. Um, I would highly encourage you to, to, to become one. If it's not here, it's, you know, wherever God would have you. But, yeah, we, we want, I just wanted to clarify that because a question did come up in regards to that. Let me give just a couple minutes to meditate on this, this uh, chapter and then just make a few comments. All right, has everyone got the elements that's wanting to partake? Well, this is, you know, Roel picked this passage. This is just one of the most majestic <laughs> chapters in Scripture, just glorious. We, we just started singing that song by Andrew Peterson, Is He Worthy? And it flows out of this chapter. And... This is a chapter, it's all about the worthiness of the lamb that was slain. But it always gets me. <laughs> Verse 8 always gets me. You can't convince me for one moment that prayer meetings don't matter. And <laughs> brethren, you have these four living creatures 
whatever they are, they're glorious, holy, majestic beings. And they're falling down with these 24 elders in this act of full devotion and worship. And they just got two things with them. A harp and your prayers. That's incredible. And that is so encouraging to pray. Is it not? I, mean, I just imagine, I don't know, I just like to think about these things, but I just imagine in glory, you know, Jesus is unveiling how people were brought to Christ. We heard Brother Pat's testimony, how people were brought to Christ, which is often, often through the prayers of the saints, right? I just imagine him going over, get a whiff of this, smell this aroma. And he peels back and shows the time we're on our knees praying that God would give us a convert from the streets and we could baptize him. That's a sweet-smelling aroma to heaven. I mean, not just, it's not just the saints. It's that these creatures, these heavenly beings are worshiping. And notice the focal point. The focal point is Christ. His worthiness. Three times it says he was slain. This Lamb of God who was slain. He alone is worthy to receive power and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is a new song. It's a new song that they're singing. And it's new because never before, if we can talk about the history of eternity, I know we, we fall short of being able to capture that, but never before had God taken upon himself flesh, human flesh. I mean, we know what human flesh is. It's nothing but sinful. That God would take that upon himself and then take it upon himself to be slain. For the purpose of bearing in his body your sin, Christian. Not his own. He was impeccable. He was perfect. Never sinned once. But he bore our sins for us. That he might bring us into this <laughs> holy chorus, this, this song, this arena of worship. And brethren, if, if these sinless creatures are able to praise that, how much more are we going to be on the receiving end of it, right? <laughs> it's just a wonderful picture. Glorious picture. Praise the living God. And without the shedding of blood, I didn't get any, I guess I didn't get any elements, brethren. Can I please get some? Um, do we have any left? Okay. Yeah, these, these here are a picture. These symbols. It's interesting, these are symbols that we, God has ordained for us to remember this. Remember the very thing that's captured here in chapter 5. And it's interesting, it's not just... For now, when we get in glory, the reality of this is forever the anthem of praise and worship. Yeah. Ever. Even those who are not redeemed by it, those who are just holy beings, they're, they're, they're marveling at this thing. That God would become a man and shed his blood for guilty, wicked sinners. When, you know, there's a, a host of angels that were cast out, and rightly so, by their wickedness, had no Savior. No hope for forgiveness. But God has extended it to you and I. And you know it wasn't because we figured out the gospel and we were smart. We just happened to be in the right place. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with His pure goodness and kindness. He had set His love upon us in eternity past. And brother, without the shedding of blood, there's just no remission. And so we're reminded weekly of these elements. And we are who we are by the Son of Man. He, he came and rescued us and gave us an eternal life. So, brethren, let's, let's eat this in remembrance of Him. And this cup is the new covenant in His blood. And He said, do it in remembrance of Him. And Father, we thank You for such a wonderful, merciful Savior. Well, we desire to worship Him now in spirit and truth. We pray, we, we pray for enabling grace to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.
When we're finished, just walk out. No, when we're finished singing, you just come up.
We serve a great God. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Psalm 23. Almost used up my voice singing. <laughs> if that's what you can call that. The church gave me the Joyful Noise Award many years ago. Little bitty, um, what do they call it? Trophy. Trophy. Little bitty thing, about that big. Joyful Noise Award. I carried that thing with me everywhere. Best I can do is make a joyful noise. And uh, I was reminiscing about that with dear sister. I said, I lost it in India. <laughs> I don't know where that thing is. Yeah. Anyway, Psalm 23. Very familiar psalm. Psalm of David. We're going to read all six verses. I hope to get through the first verse uh, with you this morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its faithfulness. Thank you for its promises. Thank you that thou art not a man that thou should lie, but that everything that you have said is true. Bless us in this place this morning as it seems good to you. You know the heart, you know the need of every one that is here. We are but men, we are but flesh, but you have called us. And I pray that you would be pleased to use your word to help your children this morning in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm 23 is David's testimony of the faithfulness of God to his soul. He wrote it as an old man. Young Christians can, can boast about the faithfulness of God. They've been saved a year. Yes, God's been faithful. But, uh, but David writes as an old man. And he looks back on years. Years of testimony. Years of experiences. Years of walking with God. And he opens up this psalm with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord had chosen David to be his own. The Lord had sought him out. We don't know when he was converted. We know he was. We don't know when God came to David where he was at, as he was, a sinner in need of a Savior. And when God saved him from his sin... But we know God did. David writes about it. I read about it in Psalm 32. David remembers the time when God in, did not, God chose not to impute his sin to his charge and to make him righteous in the eyes of the Almighty, to justify him freely. The Lord had come to David. The Lord had saved David. The Lord had been with David. When David stood before Saul as a teenager, he could testify of what God had done for him. And how that giant called Goliath was nothing compared to what God had already done. 
God had cared for him all of his life. And he knew it. He watched over him. He preserved him. And now he's getting old. And I'm not preaching this because now I'm getting old. But I am preaching this way. David wrote it as an older man. By the way, he died when he was 70. I've got one more year on David so far. The Lord had proved himself faithful to David. And David wanted to testify to that end. The whole of this psalm follows on the heels of I shall not want. And every statement after that is a testimony of I shall not want. David's testimony. The phrase I shall not want then becomes the major theme of this psalm. And it is opened up and expounded in all the rest that David says. When David said I shall not want he was saying God had proved himself over and over and over again. God had provided all that was needful for David throughout all of David's life. Hold on to that phrase. God had provided all that was needful for David throughout all of David's life. And David could make this statement, I shall not want, because he had confidence in God and because he had confidence in God's Word. He believed God and he believed what God had said. He didn't have the complete and the total uh, uh, canon of Scripture as we do today, but he had some of the Word of God. The kings of Israel had a copy of the Word of God next to the throne. You read it. God used him to write some of it. He knew what God had said. He knew what God had said was true. We have that New Testament verse that says that he which has begun a good work in you shall what finish it. David didn't have Philippians 1.6, but he knew the truth of that. The whole of this psalm speaks of the fact that God began something and David's confidence that he's going to live in the house of God. God's going to finish it. And so he knows what Christians have known for all generations. Once God begins to work in you, God's going to finish it. God's going to be faithful to you. He was confident regarding the fact that he had been justified by faith, by grace, through faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, Jehovah, is my uh, shepherd. He is the, my Savior. The same Jehovah is Jesus in the New Testament. And the same one that had become David's Lord and shepherd is the same one who is our Lord and shepherd if we are Christians today. The same one. And David could testify that God had saved him. Forgiven him his sins. Removed his sins and made him righteous in the eyes of the Almighty. He could had this confidence in God's word. Concerning God's ability to preserve him to the end. He could write and did write in Psalm 103 verse 1. Verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is... Uh, from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto, his, unto children's children. And please forgive me if I'm kind of looking down. I'm going to interrupt this message. For, I've got cataracts. I've got glasses that are not working. I've got something on my heart I want to share. And I put it in large print. David spoke of a mercy that attended him that was from everlasting to everlasting. And that encompassed David's life. A God who has been from everlasting to everlasting interrupted time 
saved David by his mercy. Paul writes to Titus that we are saved by mercy. He writes to Ephesians, we are saved by grace. We are saved by hope. The scripture speaks of that work of God. And mercy, having God having mercy upon a sinner. And David knew something about it. And knew that if it, if it was from everlasting to everlasting, and God had bestowed it upon him, that David was secure. David was secure. Not because David was better than anybody else, but because God had mercy from everlasting to everlasting upon David. He had confidence in God's word regarding spiritual refreshment. Psalm 23, 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. As God from time to time would take his servant David, his sheep David, and bring him aside into a quiet, cool place where he could lay down. You know, sheep don't lay down unless the shepherd is close by. I don't know if you know that or not. Sheep are skittish and they're all the while nervous because the enemy is, could very easily come. But when the shepherd's close by, you see, they just, they just lay down. They lay down because the shepherd's there. I want you to get a hold of that this morning. <laughs> Whatever the circumstances you and I might be facing this morning, there are some green pastures and still waters for God's people. In the quiet of the night or in the early morning or wherever it is God brings you to a place and you just sort of, yeah, I can lay down now, I can rest now, I can relax because God's here. He's going to take care of me. I know He is. And this is where David, after years of walking with God, sat down and said, you know, there's times when God gives His people refreshment. He had confidence in God's Word regarding spiritual comfort. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. I'm in the middle of this thing. I'm in the middle of this valley. This is not this night. This is not a lush green valley that spreads out before you with river, rivers and all trees that you can rest in and going up on this side a nice beautiful mountain and going up on this side a nice beautiful mountain. That's not what that Hebrew word translated valley means. This is a ravine. This is a this is a sharp a rise coming down to a V that has a walkway through it and there's no way up. You can't escape, and there's no way going back. And you've got to go forward. And the sheep go right into it. And, uh, <laughs> but the shepherd is there with his rod to lead them and comfort them in the middle of it. The shepherd is there in this very dark, hard place. Know something about that. He's been in that place before. And the Lord was right there with him. And he knew something. He knew something about facing eternity with a little confidence. Because you see, mercy had followed him all the days of his life. And goodness had followed him all the days of his life. And, 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 and as he's now old and he looks back on all the days of his life, and he's been followed by mercy and he's been followed by goodness and he looks forward. And there is eternity with his yawning mouth before him. And, and what am I to expect? What's waiting for me out there? Well, he looks back at what has been with him all these days. And he turns and looks at eternity and he says, Surely. Surely. Are you young preachers here? There's a message in one word, surely. I challenge you to search it out. 
I know what's waiting for me. Because all the days of my life, mercy and good, goodness and mercy have followed me. I know they're going to follow me into eternity. And so he had a confidence in what was waiting for him. And so he sits down, as it were, with pen and paper, and he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And all of these things come flooding into his mind, and he writes this down. And he remembers those things. But sometimes the child of God does not feel like goodness and mercy are following him. Does not feel like that he's comforted. Sometimes the child of God does not feel like all his needs have been met, are being met. I shall not want. I shall not come into need. I shall not lack. But Brother Pat, I'm lacking something. I, I don't have this. I don't have that in my, in my Christian life. And, and yet this says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. What about times like that? You see, because I know that in a church this size and with visitors here, that there are people listening to my voice saying, that's what David could say, but I can't say that. I can't say the Lord is my shepherd and add to it, I shall not lack because I believe the Lord is my shepherd, but I'm lacking something. I'm in a place where I feel a need and I don't feel like God is doing for me what God's word says he would promise to do. What about times like that, Brother Pat? What about times when a child of light sits in darkness? Is this verse still true, Brother Pat? What about those times? In addition, many times we not only do not feel like all of our needs are met by our shepherd, but the reality is, brethren, there are times when we are not seeing the promises of God fulfilled in our life at that moment. That's the reality of Christianity. That is it. So what about those times? Because that's where I want to focus on. I want to focus on those times. Because you, I open up this message by saying, David believed that what God said was true. Because God said it. And sat down and said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's true. Now, you study David's life, read David's life. You know, he ran and he hid for his life from Saul for a long time. You know, he hid in caves. You know, there were times he didn't have proper food. You know, there's a, a lot of things that came into David's life as he began his life of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. What about times like that? Well, the answer to that is first and foremost. And let this settle down in your heart as a truth that cannot ever escape. And that is this. God's word is always true. Amen. It is amazing to me how many Christ people who profess to be Christians question the sufficiency of the scriptures. Question sometimes the veracity of the scriptures, the truthfulness of the scriptures question whether or not it can be trusted or not. When God says thus and those, can I trust God that he meant what he said? Yes, sir. You see, this must be first. You say, Brother Pat, when you went to Mexico, what was the first message you preached? I preached the word of God is true. <laughs> when you went to India, what was the first message you preached? I preached that the word of God is true. And if we're going to know anything about God, we're going to have to get it from the book that he gave us that spoke of him. 
This long extended conversation with a Hindu priest. And they got their writings, right? I mean, you know, they have their religious writings. And I got him to confess what I know to be true, that there are errors there. Ooh. I also was in a place where he admitted some of the gods we worship, they do things worse than I do. That's true. That's a true statement. I said, but not my God. Hmm. My God's holy. He never sins. Well, how do you get to know Him? Well, He gave us a book. And He says, this is who I am. This is who I am. And if you're going to know God, you're going to have to find Him in the pages of this book. You're not going to be able to touch Him or feel Him or smell Him or see Him. He's invisible. You're going to have to learn of Him on the pages of the Word of God. So we begin there. You're a Christian. You laid your Bible aside. You're in a dangerous place. You're a Christian. You haven't picked up your Bible in a while. You're in a dangerous place. We begin right here. God's Word is always true. Whatever He said, despite what we feel, you see, despite what we feel, whatever God says is true. Yes. Brother Pat, you just don't understand my circumstances. You don't know how I'm feeling. I don't want to be mean here, but I don't care because God has said something that is true. You don't care about my... No, I don't care about this because I want your focus on the Scriptures and not on your problem. There's a God revealed in the Word of God that can take care of that. And you've laid aside His book and trying to find help in the world. You're not going to find it there. You do realize, don't you, the world's got its own set of problems and they can't fix them. They don't have the answer to it because they've turned their back on the Word of God. The answer to it is here. So we begin there. We always begin there. The Word of God is true. Whatever God has said, you can trust it because God said it. Because God said it. Everything God brings into our life, this is the second point, everything God brings into our life is designed to teach us to teach us that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want. Everything is designed to teach us that He is guiding us, directing us, ordering our steps, and we will, He will make sure we have exactly what we need. In other words, David lacked nothing that God determined was good and needful for him. I'm going to say that again. Okay? Because what David's writing about here is not what you think. It is what he understands of what God has been to him and for him for his whole life. David lacked nothing that God determined was good and needful for his life. Write that down and put it on your refrigerator, all right? <laughs> if that's what you do. Put it in your Bible. Because one of these days you're going to say, oh Lord, I need this, and you're not. And then you're going to be remembering that David said, I never lacked anything that God determined was good and needful for me. What does God's Word say? Because this is where we need to get this. I shall not lack for all that is necessary to sustain my life 
unless God determines, are you listening? Unless God determines that my necessities are not necessary. We have a hard time with that in America. We have cabinets that are full of food. We go to the refrigerator and it's full, mostly. We go to the freezer and it's full, mostly. We go to the store and mostly they're full. That's the blessing of God upon this nation. I would probably say that in this room, none of you have ever gone hungry. Mr. Mill, if you have, you quickly got another one right behind it. Food, we would say, is a necessary thing. Housing, it's a necessary thing. Health, it's a necessary thing. These clothes, it's a necessary thing. Necessary thing. And yet I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is afflicted with a thorn in the flesh. And he prays three times, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he prays three times, God, remove this thing. And God says, no, I'm not going to do that. Instead, in the middle of this, you're going to learn that my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to remove it. It's going to stay with you, and you're going to find out, and you're going to learn that my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul breaks out in a statement here. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, and then the next statement is, in necessities. And he goes on with a list. I take pleasure in necessities. I find in my Christian life, there are things I need that God hasn't provided for me, and I'm good with that for now. God hasn't provided me with everything that I have needed with regard to this, that, or the other. I'm okay with that because God has determined that my necessities are not needful right now. That is a hard place for us to get to. That is a hard place to get to. Elijah, or Elisha, one of the prophets got that. Elijah. The drought is pretty much finished, food supplies all gone. God puts him by a brook, that dries up. God sends him to a Gentile widow and that has a little bit of corn left, <laughs> enough to feed her and her son, and then they're gonna die. You know the story? You know the story? First Kings chapter 17. Elijah says to her, by the way, I believe she knows something about God. Elijah says to her, you prepare something for me too. And so she takes what was going to be two and she divides it again and makes it three. And they eat together. And they, you know, she thinks, okay, that's the end of it, right? I wish I had a barrel full. Maybe she's thinking... I wish I had something for my kid. You know, he, he deserves better than this. I, I don't know what she was thinking. But they go the next day, and you know what happened. You, you know the story, right? What, what's in the bottom of that empty barrel? There's just enough for three people for that day. Okay. And then the next day, what? Give us this day our daily bread. None of us live like that, and that's okay. God has blessed us, and I'm not saying we ought to live like that. I'm just saying it has happened to some of God's choicest servants. And they could say with David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. Early in our ministry, we, we didn't have any income. The church was small, and they could barely do anything. No, we didn't, nobody knew what was going on, and we didn't tell anybody. Still don't, for the most part, unless asked. We had one bit of beans left that was going to be the meal for that night. Nothing else, nothing else in the house except water to cook the beans with. And my wife burnt the beans. <laughs> that woman thou gavest me. <laughs> <laughs> a 
What are we going to do? I don't know, but the Bible says, give us this day our daily bread. Hmm? Standing in the kitchen, we pray. Phone rings. We've been ministering to this lady up the street for a couple of years. She calls and she says, you know, I've been fixing this roast beef dinner and I've got this and I've got that. And I, I suddenly, she's a widow lady. I suddenly realized, I can't eat all this food. Would you and your family like to come and, and join me? I, yes, ma'am, we would. <laughs> I didn't say a word. So we're there enjoying this meal. And the next day or so was my birthday. And she remembers and she said, oh, and, and she gets up from the table. We just, and she goes to the cupboard and she breaks out these uh, grocery bags. And she's pulling down stuff and filling up grocery bags. So you've got to have a cake for your birthday. And she doesn't know a thing. And we're walking home with groceries. <laughs> Next day, I pick up the phone. I call her. I said, I said, you're always telling me how you feel like God never uses you and that you're kind of worthless in the kingdom of God and you wonder why in the world God saved you in the first place and, and on and on you go and I'm telling you, don't worry about it. God has a place for you. Let me tell you a story. And she's weeping. God provided our necessities. We were in need. We were in need. When necessary and good, God will bring sickness. That's not something you hear today, right? If you're a Christian, you ought to be wealthy and healthy, right? But the scripture teaches when necessary and good, God will bring sickness. And when necessary and good, God will take that sickness away. Psalm 31, 15. My times are in His hands. All the good times, right? What about the bad times? What about what we call bad? I want to put it that way. What about that? Does God keep you on your sick bed? Yeah, He does. You got testimonies of that right here in this assembly. The whole history of Christianity is testimony of God, people becoming sick and God keeping them and then God raising them up and God using them. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know the, the chapter. To everything there is a season, right? Chapter 3, verse 1, and a time for every purpose under the heaven. And then verse 2 talks about a time to be born and a time to die. Okay? Spans that. 70 or 80 years or whatever it is God gives us. And verse 3 inserts a time to heal. Now let me make two statements. If there is a time for healing, as the Scripture says there is, then there must be a time for sickness. We love this chapter. We love Ecclesiastes as a thing for everything under the sun. And we list all these things off and we rejoice in God and we read it quickly and we go on. Wow, what an amazing God we have. And we forgot to think about the fact there's a time for healing means I'm going to be sick sometime. Oof, hadn't thought about that. Hadn't thought that God may put me on my sick bed, teach me a few things, then heal me and raise me back up and try and do me a and use me again. Hadn't thought about that. The second thing we hadn't thought about is that phrase, a time to die. None of us actually have considered the implication of that. There is a time to die. What is God going to use to bring me to that time? Is it going to be a heart attack? I don't know. Is it going to be cancer? I don't know. Is it going to be a car wreck? I don't know. Bullet? I, I don't know. All I know is there's a time when my life's going to end on this side and continue on the other. One of the things about dying is you might get sick. And the purpose of that sickness is not to bring healing except in an eternal sense. That sickness will never be healed on this side. It brings you into glory. There is a time when God 
believes it is needful for you to be sick and he brings that sickness to you and the Lord is my shepherd I shall not lack being sick because it's good and needful for me until God heals me either on this side or the other the Lord is my shepherd I shall not lack for any trials in my life if it is good and necessary for me to have a trial I shall have it because God will ordain it if it's good and necessary for God to teach me something about his word and the means of God to accomplish that is a trial so that we are brought back to the scriptures and we learn something about this thing and we come out of it able to help somebody else God sees that as good and necessary God's going to bring that your way you're not going to lack for trials Peter in his epistle first Peter chapter 1 talks about trials and he speaks of though now for a season there's a time frame that God has ordered there's a season when God says this brother this sister needs a season of trials and now for a season if need be if need be if it's if I determine it to be good and necessary if need be the scripture goes on to say ye are in heaviness in heaviness brought about by what first Peter chapter 1 verse 7 heaviness through through the means of manifold temptations many and varied trials not just one okay I got a handle on it, Lord no no you <laughs> what about this one oh, what about this one? Oh, wait a minute Lord what about this one Many and varied. So that we're brought to the place where we say, yes, Lord. And God brings us out. Joseph. You know the story of Joseph? Joseph's in Pharaoh's prison. He's in Pharaoh's prison. I mean, this is a man that's had a dream that God gave him. This is a man that knows something about God, who has walked with God in such an intimate way. He knows the plan of God in advance for his life. He has this sense that God's going to do something with him. He knows what God's going to do. And he's sitting in prison. Psalm 105 talked about that event being a trial to him because he knew the Word of God. And he knew what God had said. And it was a trial to him to be in that prison. And then one day God brought him out. Daniel, faithful brother, praying, seeking the Lord's face. And, and, and he's in a strange land. And he's seeking to serve the Lord as best as he knows in the midst of this land. Daniel, God is visiting with him. And God, he knows something about He's writing a book that we have preserved for us in the Scriptures. He knows something about God. He knows something about inspiration. He knows something about seeing and hearing the voice of God. And he prays and he seeks the Lord's face. And they throw him in a lion's den. Because he loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do they want to kill Christians? Of all the people in the world, why do they want to kill Christians? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you love the Lord Jesus Christ and they hate Him. They hate Him. And the next day God pulls them out. Paul and Silas, they've been sent to preach. And they're preaching. And they come to this place called Philippi and they throw him in jail <laughs> why did they throw him in jail <laughs> because they're preaching the gospel someone said they didn't kill Christians in the first century and put them in jail because they preached Jesus they killed him and put him in jail because they preached Jesus was the only way back to God and you start preaching Jesus is the only way back to God and all the religions of the world including those that claim to be Christians are going to rise up against you Every one of them. Not that way, not that way, not your way, God's way. And they put him in jail. 
So Silas looks over at Paul, and Paul looks over at Silas and says, what do we do? Well, let's sing. That sounds like a good thing to me. Let's sing. We're going to have a worship service. God is in this place too. Right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I then, their feet are stuck in stocks. They're bound up in a bottom of a Roman prison system. Uh, they're in the deepest part because the jailer's been charged. If these guys get out of here, you're dead. And he throws them into the deepest, darkest pit, binds their feet up. And they've been beaten already. They're bloodied on their back and their backside. And they're singing praises to God <laughs> because He is worthy. We just sang that this morning. Is He worthy in a Philippian jail? Or just on Sunday morning? And God breaks that place wide open. How do you do that with an earthquake? You know the story, right? Every jail cell was open. And they were gathered around Paul and Silas. And the jailer comes in. He's afraid he's going to die. He's going to kill himself. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. Paul said that. How do you know they were all there? Well, they gathered around the guy that was praising the Lord in prison. They want to know a little bit about that Jesus that you're talking about. That's my understanding of it. But he could say they're all here. He had to have some information. And God saves that jailer and his household. Was that trial worth that? Oh, brother, be careful before you answer. But it, the answer is yes. But be careful before you answer, all right? Because tomorrow there's coming a trial that a lost person might be watching you in. When it is necessary and good, God allows us to be afflicted. Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But, you know the verse? The Lord delivereth him out of them all. I shall not lack for affliction. I shall not lack for trials. I shall not lack for anything that is necessary and good for my life. I shall not lack for open doors of ministry. Because God opens those doors. But with those open doors, I shall not lack for enemies of the gospel. And now what the scripture says. Hmm. In the Corinthian letter, the apostle Paul said, in the Corinthian letter, a great and effectual door is opened unto me and. The Greek word, by the way, is there's two of them that goes with and. One is uh, you got these things and they can all be divided up and separated. The second one is that they, the things connecting are bound together so they're not able to be separated. And you could search that out on your own, but that's the, that's the, that's the truth. And so that Greek word and, God has opened a door and there are many adversaries. They go together, inseparable. Wherever the gospel goes, God's enemies rise up in mass against it. When good and necessary, I shall not want for night seasons, dark times, nor shall I lack for the joy that comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I shall not want for times when my soul feels dry and cold and I wonder where God is when just last week or just uh, yesterday or just a month ago we enjoyed sweet communion and fellowship together and we rejoiced together and we sang together. You do know the Lord sings over you, right? <laughs> you search it out if you don't. It's in the Old Testament. And, uh, and we rejoiced together and we worshiped and today, it's like he's a thousand miles away, and I know he's not. The scripture says he won't forsake me, but he don't feel like it. 
that he's here and it's dry and it's and it and Lord give me something to go out today with and I close the Bible up and face the day without that something that verse that text that whatever that sense that God is there and it's a strange place to be and it's a hard place to be and it's it's a dry place and it's not green pastures and rivers and springs. It's a valley that's dark. And it's not uh, my cup runneth over. It's a table and he's spreading it. I'm waiting. But in the middle of all of my enemies. Psalm 92. My horn Shalt thou, that's future tense, shalt thou exalt. The indication is right now he's not lifted up. But it's coming. It's coming. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I was. It looks like it's run out. It looks like. Feels like. But I shall be anointed with fresh oil. That's the promise of the scriptures, by the way. Read John Gill on that if you, don't, if you want to rejo- something to rejoice over. Uh, that is a blessing, that verse. God has promised to anoint His people with fresh oil. Not yesterday's. Not last year's. Not what happened in 1989, but today. Today. I shall not lack for weapons formed against me. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. We hang on to shall prosper. We forget that our enemies are forming weapons against us. taking them up after they formed them, coming after us with a weapon that is greater than we are. But it's not going to prosper. But that doesn't mean it's not been made for us by our enemies. So that we're very much aware of it. I shall not lack for weapons formed against me. I shall not lack for enemies. If I'm a Christian, I'm an have the whole world as my enemy. The Lord Jesus Christ told us that. And they hated him first, and they're going to hate you. But also, there's a promise over in the Old Testament that says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand uh, at thy right hand, and it shall not come nigh thee. Now, I know some may have trouble with drawing out those Old Testament promises like that. And I see that as that a promise for God's people in the presence of their enemies. I've walked a pathway with my God since the summer of 1975 where I've seen my enemies fall to the right and to the left with my own eyes. Where I've seen my enemies make plans and fail dig pits that they fell into, roll a stone that was meant for me that fell on them, where I've seen with mine own eyes those that have have guaranteed me that they would destroy me, only to watch and see God lay them aside. We have enemies. And if you're serving the Lord, you're going to have enemies. Enemies. And if you want to serve the Lord, you need to understand you're going to have enemies. And if you're here lost, and you're considering coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, embracing Him as your Savior, you need to know the truth. Paul said to those young Christians and to those he preached through that we through much tribulation shall enter the kingdom of God. But come on, come and join us, because God never fails. And God's Word is always true. And what God has said can be trusted. And He said if you will call upon Him, He will save you. And He said if you will repent, He will save you. And He said if you will follow Him, He will lead you. Now it may be a dry time. And it may be a necessary time. And it may be a sickness. And it may be an enemy. But He will lead you through. All the way to glory. 
We do not preach a form of Christianity that is a pie-in-the-sky kind of ministry that is health and wealth and a rose petal uh, 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 spread in front of your ways as you just walk gingerly into glory. No! We preach a form of Christianity where you have an enemy on every side, where you are told in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the whole armor of God, to use the sword of God as your weapon against the enemies of God, to lay hold by faith upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your shield, and to trust Him. To trust Him who has begun a good work in you to finish it. To finish it. Are you confused right now? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. What is it that you need this morning? Where are you this morning? Dear Christian brother and sister. Brother Pat, I'm in need. Good. That's a good place to be. Because your Savior has promised you shall not want. Just interpret it the way He does. I shall not lack for accusers before the throne of grace. Is that true? You ever read the book of Job? (laughs) If not, I recommend it. Opening chapters, the accuser. At the throne of grace, accusing Job. By the way, God has nothing bad to say about His servant. Those preachers and those commentaries that try to condemn Job, they're on the wrong side of God on that issue. God did not condemn him. Now, did he have some needs? Oh, yeah, he had some needs. But from God's perspective, have you considered my servant Job? Are you kidding? And Satan said, are you kidding me? And uh, I look forward to this. And God's smiling. There's two things going on in that conversation. One is God's for Job. And if God be for us, who's going to be against us? (laughs) The other is Job's for God. And even if his wife says, curse God and, and die, he's not going to do it. God's done something for that man that only God could do, and he is committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's got some problems. In the end, God fixes that too. I shall not lack for accusers before the throne of grace. For those who would stand and say, have you seen what Pat Horner has done? Did you hear what he said? Uh, I shall not lack for accusers. Nor shall I lack for an advocate whose five bleeding wounds plead mercy and before the throne of grace. Amen. Amen. Isaac Watts, no, not Isaac Watts. I wish it was, but it's not. Charles Wesley wrote a song, and I'm going to close with this. And I'm not going to sing it. Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Five bleeding wounds he bears received at Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him. Oh, forgive, they cry. Forgive him. Oh, forgive, they cry. Now let that ransom sinner free. My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for His child. I can no longer fear. With confidence now I draw nigh. With confidence 
I now draw nigh. And Father, Abba, Father, I cry. Because the five bleeding wounds of Jesus Christ, because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross has secured sinners for the Father. Every one given to Jesus Christ by the Father shall be saved. Amen. Are you here this morning and you don't have your sins forgiven? Jesus Christ can forgive you. Will forgive you. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Amen. Come, dear one. Are you here and you're a child of God and the shepherd, you think, has not treated you well? Cast that lie aside and believe the truth of the Scriptures. I shall not want. We'll end where we started. What God says is true. Trust Him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bow before Thee. Thou art our God, Thou art our Father, Thou art the great God of heaven and earth. And we thank You for giving us Your Word, and we thank You that when we read it, the Spirit of God convinces us of the truth of it. Bless us. Bless each one that is in this place. You know the heart. You know the need. You know where they're at. You know those that are lost. And draw them to your Son with cords of love and mercy. Draw them, my Father. And your children that are weak and frail and struggling, draw them back into, into the place where they can trust you and believe you and believe your Word. And those uh, here that are serving you, that love you, that are, have a zeal of heart and mind and soul to serve you, Help them. Strengthen them. The enemy would love to destroy us. As we sit surrounded by them, open our eyes so that we can see greater is he that is with us than they that are with him. Bless your people today, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.